Chapter twenty six of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Anka in Mannheim, Germany, August two thousand ten. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter twenty six The Pont du Gard Inn. Such of my readers as have made a pedestrian excursion to the south of France may perchance have noticed, about midway between the town of Beaucaire and the village of Bellegarde, a little nearer to the former than to the latter, a small roadside inn, from the front of which hung, creaking and flapping in the wind, a sheet of tin covered with a grotesque representation of the Pont du Gard. This modern place of entertainment stood on the left-hand side of the post-road, and backed upon to the Rhone. It also boasted of what, in Languedoc, is styled a garden, consisting of a small plot of ground, on the side opposite to the main entrance reserved for the reception of guests. A few dingy olives and stunted fig-trees struggled hard for existence, but their withered dusty foliage abundantly proved how unequal was the conflict. Between these sickly shrubs grew a scanty supply of garlic, tomatoes, and escalots, while, lone and solitary, like a forgotten sentinel, a tall pine raised its melancholy head in one of the corners of this unattractive spot, and displayed its flexible stem and fan-shaped summit dried and cracked by the fierce heat of the subtropical sun. In the surrounding plain, which more resembled a dusty lake than solid ground, were scattered a few miserable stalks of wheat, the effect, no doubt, of a curious desire on the part of the agriculturists of the country to see whether such a thing as the raising of grain in those parched regions was practicable. Each stalk served as a perch for a grasshopper, which regaled the passers-by through this Egyptian scene with its strident, monotonous tone. For about seven or eight years the little tavern had been kept by a man and his wife with two servants, a chambermaid named Trinette, and an ostler called Picot. This small staff was quite equal to all the requirements, for a canal between Beaucaire and Aigues-Mortes had revolutionized transportation by substituting boats for the cart and the stagecoach. And, as though to add to the daily misery which this prosperous canal inflicted on the unfortunate innkeeper, whose utter ruin it was fast accomplishing, it was situated between the Rhône, from which it had its source, and the post-road, it had depleted not a hundred steps from the inn, of which we have given a brief but faithful description. The innkeeper himself was a man of from forty to fifty years of age, tall, strong, and bony, a perfect specimen of the natives of those southern latitudes. He had dark, sparkling, and deep-set eyes, hooked nose, and teeth white as those of a carnivorous animal. His hair, like his beard, which he wore under his chin, was thick and curly, and in spite of his age but slightly interspersed with a few silvery threads. His naturally dark complexion had assumed a still further shade of brown, from the habit the unfortunate man had acquired of stationing himself from morning till eve at the threshold of his door, on the lookout for guests who seldom came. Yet there he stood, day after day, exposed to the meridional rays of a burning sun, with no other protection for his head than a red handkerchief twisted around it, after the manner of the Spanish muleteers. This man was our old acquaintance, Gaspard Caderousse. His wife, on the contrary, whose maiden name had been Madeleine Radel, was pale, meagre, and sickly-looking. Born in the neighbourhood of Arles, she had shared in the beauty of which its women are proverbial, but that beauty had gradually withered between the devastating influence of the slow fever so prevalent among dwellers by the ponds of Egmont and the marshes of Camargue. She remained nearly always in her second-floor chamber, shivering in her chair or stretched languid and feeble on her bed, while her husband kept his daily watch at the door a duty he performed with so much the greater willingness, as it saved him the necessity of listening to the endless plaints and murmurs of his helpmate, who never saw him without breaking into bitter invectives against fate, to all of which a husband would calmly return an unvarying reply in these philosophic words. Hush, la carconte, it is God's pleasure that things should be so. The sobriquet of la carconte had been bestowed on Madeleine Radel, from the fact that she had been born in a village so called, situated between Salon and Lombesque, and as a custom existed among the inhabitants of that part of France where Caderousse lived of styling every person by some particular and distinctive appellation. 
Her husband had bestowed on her the name of La Caconte, in place of a sweet and euphonious name of Madeleine, which in all probability his rude guttural language would not have enabled him to pronounce. Still, let it not be supposed that amid this affected resignation of the will of Providence, the unfortunate innkeeper did not writhe under the double misery of seeing the hateful canal carry off his customers and his profits, and the daily infliction of his peevish partner's murmurs and lamentations. Like other dwellers in the South, he was a man of sober habits and moderate desires, but fond of external show, vain and addicted to display. During the days of his prosperity, not a festivity took place without himself and wife being among the spectators. He dressed in the picturesque costume worn upon grand occasions by the inhabitants of the south of France, bearing equal resemblance to the style adopted both by the Catalans and Andalusians, while La Carconte displayed the charming fashion prevalent among the women of Arles, a mode of attire borrowed equally from Greece and Arabia but by degrees watch-chains, necklaces, parti-coloured scarfs, embroidered bodices, velvet vests, elegantly worked stockings, striped gaiters and silver buckles for the shoes, all disappeared, and Gaspard Caderousse, unable to appear abroad in his pristine splendour, had given up any further participation in the pomps and vanities, both for himself and wife, although a bitter feeling of envious discontent filled his mind as the sound of mirth and merry music from the joyous revellers reached even the miserable hostelry to which he still clung, more for the shelter than the profit it afforded. Caderousse then was, as usual, at his place of observation before the door, his eyes glancing listlessly from a piece of closely shaven grass, on which some fowls were industriously, though fruitlessly, endeavouring to turn up some grain or insect suited to their palate, to the deserted road, which led away to the north and south, when he was aroused by the shrill voice of his wife, and grumbling to himself as he went, he mounted to her chamber, first taking care, however, to set the entrance door wide open, as an invitation to any chance traveller who might be passing. At the moment Caderousse quitted his sentry-like watch before the door, the road on which he had so eagerly strained his sight was void and lonely as a desert at midday. There it lay, stretching out, into one interminable line of dust and sand, with its side bordered by tall meagre trees, altogether presenting so uninviting an appearance that no one in his senses could have imagined that any traveller, at liberty to regulate his hours for journeying, would choose to expose himself in such a formidable Sahara. Nevertheless, had Caderousse but retained his post a few minutes longer, he might have caught a dim outline of something approaching from the direction of Bellegarde. As the moving object drew nearer, he would easily have perceived that it consisted of a man and horse, between whom the kindest and most amiable understanding appeared to exist. The horse was of Hungarian breed, and ambled along at an easy pace. His rider was a priest, dressed in black and wearing a three-cornered hat, and spite of the ardent rays of a noonday sun, the pair came on with a fair degree of rapidity. Having arrived before the Pont du Gard, the horse stopped, but whether for his own pleasure or that of his rider would have been difficult to say. However that might have been, the priest, dismounting, led his steed by the bridle in search of some place to which he could secure him. Availing himself of a handle that projected from a half-fallen door, he tied the animal safely, and having drawn a red cotton handkerchief from his pocket, wiped away the perspiration that streamed from his brow. Then, advancing to the door, struck thrice with the end of his iron-shod stick. At this unusual sound, a huge black dog came rushing to meet the daring assailant of his ordinarily tranquil abode, snarling and displaying his sharp white teeth with a determined hostility that abundantly proved how little he was accustomed to society. At that moment a heavy footstep was heard descending the wooden staircase that led from the upper floor, and, with many bows and courteous smiles, mine host of the Pont du Gard besought his guest to enter. "'You are welcome, sir, most welcome,' repeated the astonished Caderousse. "'Now then, Magotin,' he cried, speaking to the dogs, "'will you be quiet? Pray don't heed him, sir. He only barks, he never bites. I make no doubt a glass of good wine would be acceptable this dreadfully hot day.' Then perceiving for the first time the garb of the traveller he had to entertain, Caderousse hastily exclaimed, "'A thousand pardons! I really did not observe whom I had the honour to receive under my poor roof. What would the abbé please to have? What refreshment can I offer?' All I have is at his service. 
The priest gazed on the person addressing him with a long and searching gaze. There even seemed a disposition on his part to court similar scrutiny on the part of the innkeeper. Then, observing in the countenance of the latter no other expression than extreme surprise as his own want of attention to an inquiry so courteously worded, he deemed it as well to terminate this dumb show, and therefore said, speaking with a strong Italian accent, "'You are, I presume, Monsieur Caderousse?' "'Yes, sir,' answered the host, even more surprised at the question than he had been by the silence—' <coughs> than he had been by the silence— <coughs> than it had been by the silence which had preceded it. I am Gaspard Caderousse, at your service. Gaspard Caderousse, rejoined the priest. Yes, Christian and surname are the same. You formerly lived, I believe, in the Allée de Millon, on the fourth floor? I did. And you followed the business of a tailor? True, I was a tailor, till the trade fell off. It is so hot at Marseilles, that really I believe that the respectable inhabitants will in time go without any clothing whatever. But talking of heat, is there nothing I can offer you by way of refreshment? Yes, let me have a bottle of your best wine, and then, with your permission, I will resume our conversation from where we left off. As you please, sir, said Caderousse, who, anxious not to lose the present opportunity of finding a customer for one of the few bottles of Cahors still remaining in his possession, hastily raised a trap-door in the floor of the apartment they were in, which served both as a parlour and kitchen. Upon issuing forth from his subterranean retreat at the expiration of five minutes, he found the abbé seated upon a wooden stool, leaning his elbow on a table, while Magotin, whose animosity seemed appeased by the unusual command of the traveller for refreshments, had crept up to him and had established himself very comfortably between his knees, his long skinny neck resting on his lap, while his dim eye was fixed earnestly on the traveller's face. "'Are you quite alone?' inquired the guest, as Caderousse placed before him the bottle of wine and a glass. "'Quite, quite alone,' replied the man. "'Or at least practically so. For my poor wife, who is the only person in the house beside myself, is laid up with illness, and unable to render me the least assistance, poor thing.' "'You are married, then,' said the priest, with a show of interest, glancing round as he spoke, at the scanty furnishing of the apartment. "'Ah, sir!' said Caderousse with a sigh. It is easy to perceive I am not a rich man, but in this world a man does not thrive the better for being honest. The abbé fixed on him a searching, penetrating glance. Yes, honest, I can certainly say that much for myself, continued the innkeeper, fairly sustaining the scrutiny of the abbé's guest. I can boast with truth of being an honest man, and, continued he significantly, with a hand on his breast and shaking his head, that is more than every one can say nowadays. "'So much the better for you, if what you assert be true,' said the abbé, "'for I am firmly persuaded that, sooner or later, the good will be rewarded and the wicked punished.' "'Such words as those belong to your profession,' answered Caderousse, "'and you do well to repeat them. "'But,' he added, with a bitter expression of countenance, "'one is free to believe them or not, as one pleases.' "'You are wrong to speak thus,' said the abbé, "'and perhaps I may, in my own person, be able to prove to you how completely you are in error.' "'What mean you?' inquired Caderousse, with a look of surprise. "'In the first place, I must be satisfied that you are the person I am in search of. "'What proofs do you require? "'Did you, in the year 1814 or 1815, know anything of a young sailor named Dantes?' "'Dantes? Did I know poor dear Edmond? "'Why, Edmond Dantes and myself were intimate friends,' exclaimed Caderousse, whose countenance flushed darkly as he caught the penetrating gaze of the abbé fixed on him, while the clear, calm eye of the questioner seemed to dilate with feverish scrutiny. "'You remind me,' said the priest, "'that the young man concerning whom I asked you was said to bear the name of Edmond.' "'Said to bear the name,' repeated Caderousse, becoming excited and eager. "'Why, he was so called, as truly as I myself bore the appellation of Gaspard Caderousse, but tell me, I pray, what has become of poor Edmond? Did you know him? Is he alive and at liberty? Is he prosperous and happy? He died a more wretched, hopeless, heartbroken prisoner than the felons who pay the penalty of their crimes at the galleys of Toulon. A deadly pallor followed the flush on the countenance of Caderousse, who turned away, and the priest saw him wiping the tears from his eyes, with the corner of the red handkerchief twisted around his head. Poor fellow, poor fellow! murmured Caderousse. Well, there, sir, is another proof that good people are never rewarded on this earth, and that none but the wicked prosper. Ah! 
continued Caderousse, speaking in the highly coloured language of the South. The world grows worse and worse. Why does not God, if he really hates the wicked, as he is said to do, send down brimstone and fire, and consume them altogether? You speak as though you had loved this young Dantes, observed the abbé, without taking any notice of his companion's vehemence. And so I did, replied Caderousse, though once, I confess, I envied him his good fortune. But I swear to you, sir, I swear to you, by everything a man holds dear, I have since then deeply and sincerely lamented his unhappy fate. There was a brief silence, during which the fixed searching eye of the abbé was employed in scrutinizing the agitated features of the innkeeper. You knew the poor lad, then, continued Caderousse. I was called to see him on his dying bed, that I might administer to him the consolations of religion. And of what did he die? asked Caderousse in a choking voice. Of what, think you, do young and strong men die in prison, when they have scarcely numbered their thirtieth year, unless it be of imprisonment? Caderousse wiped away the large beads of perspiration that gathered on his brow. But the strangest part of the story is, resumed the abbé, that Dantes, even in his dying moments, swore by his crucified Redeemer that he was utterly ignorant of the cause of his detention. And so he was, murmured Caderousse. How should he have been otherwise? Ah, sir, the poor fellow told you the truth. And for that reason he besought me to try and clear up a mystery he had never been able to penetrate, and to clear his memory should any foul spot or stain have fallen on it. And here the look of the abbé, becoming more and more fixed, seemed to rest with ill-concealed satisfaction on the gloomy depression which was rapidly spreading over the countenance of Caderousse. A rich Englishman, continued the abbé, who had been his companion in misfortune, but had been released from prison during the second restoration, was possessed of a diamond of immense value. This jewel he bestowed on Dantes upon himself quitting the prison, as a mark of his gratitude for the kindness and brotherly care with which Dantes had nursed him in a severe illness he underwent during his confinement. Instead of employing this diamond in attempting to bribe his jailers, who might only have taken it and then betrayed him to the governor, Dantes carefully preserved it, that in the event of his getting out of prison he might have wherewithal to live, for the sale of such a diamond would have quite sufficed to make his fortune. Then, I suppose, asked Caderousse, with eager, glowing looks, that it was a stone of immense value. Why, everything is relative, answered the abbé. To one in Edmond's position, the diamond certainly was of great value. It was estimated at fifty thousand francs. Bless me, exclaimed Caderousse. Fifty thousand francs! Surely the diamond was as large as not to be worth all that. No, replied the abbé. It was not of such a size as that. But you shall judge for yourself. I have it with me. The sharp gaze of Caderousse was instantly directed towards the priest's garments, as though hoping to discover the location of the treasure. Calmly drawing forth from his pocket a small box covered with black chagrin, the abbé opened it, and displayed to the dazzled eyes of Caderousse the sparkling jewel it contained, set in a ring of admirable workmanship. "'And that diamond,' cried Caderousse, almost breathless with eager admiration, "'you say is worth fifty thousand francs?' It is without the setting, which is also valuable, replied the abbé, as he closed the box and returned it to his pocket, while its brilliant hues seemed still to dance before the eyes of the fascinated innkeeper. But how comes the diamond in your possession, sir? Did Edmore make you his heir? No, merely his testamentary executor. I once possessed four dear and faithful friends, besides the maiden to whom I was betrothed, he said, and I feel convinced they of all unfeignedly grieved over my loss. The name of one of the four friends is Caderousse. The innkeeper shivered. Another of the number, continued the abbé, without seeming to notice the emotion of Caderousse, is called Anglars. And the third, in spite of being my rival, entertained a very sincere affection for me. A fiendish smile played over the features of Caderousse, who was about to break in upon the abbé's speech, when the latter, waving his hand, said, Allow me to finish first, and then, if you have any observations to make, you can do so afterwards. The third of my friends, although my rival, was much attached to me. His name was Fanon. That of my betrothed was... Stay, stay, continued the abbey. I have forgotten what he called her. Mercedes, said Caderousse eagerly. True, said the abbé, with a stifled sigh. Mercedes it was. Go on, urged Caderousse. Bring me a carafe of water, said the abbé. 
Caderousse quickly performed the stranger's bidding, and after pouring some into a glass, and slowly swallowing its contents, the abbé, resuming his usual placidity of manner, said, as he placed his empty glass on the table, "'Where did we leave off?' The name of Edmond's betrothed was Mercedes. "'To be sure. "'You will go to Marseille,' said Dantes, "'for you understand. I repeat his words just as he uttered them. Do you understand?' "'Perfectly.' You will sell this diamond, you will divide the money into five equal parts, and give an equal portion to these good friends, the only persons who have loved me upon earth. But why into five parts? asked Caderousse. You only mentioned four persons. Because the fifth is dead, as I hear. The fifth sharer in Edmond's bequest was his own father. Too true, too true, ejaculated Caderousse, almost suffocated by the contending passions which assailed him. The poor old man did die. I learned so much at Marseilles, replied the abbé, making a strong effort to appear indifferent. But from the length of time that has elapsed since the death of the elder Dantes, I was unable to obtain any particulars of his end. Can you enlighten me on that point? I do not know who could if I could not, said Caderousse. Why, I lived almost on the same floor with the poor old man. Ah, yes, about a year after the disappearance of his son, the poor old man died. Of what did he die? Why, the doctors called his complaint gastroenteritis, I believe. His acquaintances say he died of grief. But I, who saw him in his dying moments, I say he died of... Caderousse paused. Of what? said the priest, anxiously and eagerly. Why, of downright starvation. Starvation? exclaimed the abbé, springing from his seat. Why, the vilest animals are not suffered to die by such a death as that. The very dogs that wander houseless and homeless in the streets find some pitying hand to cast them a mouthful of bread, and that a man, a Christian, should be allowed to perish of hunger in the midst of other men who call themselves Christians is too horrible for belief. Oh, it is impossible, utterly impossible. What I have said, I have said, answered Caderousse. And you are a fool for having said anything about it, said a voice from the top of the stairs. Why should you meddle with what does not concern you? The two men turned quickly, and saw the sickly countenance of La Carconte peering between the baluster rails, attracted by the sound of voices. She had feebly dragged herself down the stairs, and seated on the lower step, head on knees, she had listened to the foregoing conversation. "'Mind your own business, wife,' replied Caderousse sharply. "'This gentleman asks me for information, which common politeness will not permit me to refuse.' "'Politeness, you simpleton!' retorted La Carconte. What have you to do with politeness, I should like to know? Better study a little common prudence. How do you know the motives that person may have for trying to extract all he can from you? I pledge you my word, madame, said the abbé, that my intentions are good, and that your husband can incur no risk, provided he answers me candidly. Ah, that's all very fine, retorted the woman. Nothing is easier than to begin with fair promises and assurances of nothing to fear. But when poor silly folks, like my husband there, have been persuaded to tell all they know, the promises and assurances of safety are quickly forgotten, and at some moment when nobody is expecting it, behold trouble and misery, and all sorts of persecutions, are heaped on the unfortunate wretches who cannot even see whence all their afflictions come. Nay, nay, my good woman, make yourself perfectly easy, I beg of you. Whatever evils may befall you, they will not be occasioned by my instrumentality, that I solemnly promise you. La Carconte muttered a few inarticulate words, then let her head again drop upon her knees, and went to a fit of ague, leaving the two speakers to resume the conversation, but remaining so as to be able to hear every word they uttered. Again the abbé had been obliged to swallow a draught of water, to calm the emotions that threatened to overpower him. When he had sufficiently recovered himself, he said, "'It appears, then, that the miserable old man you were telling me of was forsaken by every one. Surely, had not such been the case, he would not have perished by so dreadful a death. Why, he was not altogether forsaken, continued Caderousse, for Mercedes de Catalan and Monsieur Morel were very kind to him, but somehow the poor old man had contracted a profound hatred for Fernand, the very person, added Caderousse with a bitter smile, that you named just now as being one of Dantes's faithful and attached friends. And was he not so? asked the abbé. Gaspard, Gaspard, murmured the woman, from her seat on the stairs. Mind what you are saying. Caderousse made no reply to these words, though evidently irritated and annoyed by the interruption. But, addressing the abbé, said, Can a man be faithful to another whose wife he covets and desires for himself? 
but Dantes was so honourable and true in his own nature that he believed everybody's professions of friendship. Poor Edmond, he was cruelly deceived, but it was fortunate that he never knew, or he might have found it more difficult, when on his deathbed, to pardon his enemies. And whatever people may say, continued Caderousse, in his native language, which was not altogether devoid of rude poetry, I cannot help being more frightened at the idea of the malediction of the dead than the hatred of the living. Imbecile! exclaimed La Caconte. Do you, then, know in what manner Fernand injured Dantes? inquired the abbé of Caderousse. Do I? No one better. Speak out, then, say what it was. Gaspard! cried La Caconte. Do as you will, you are master, but if you take my advice, you'll hold your tongue. Well, wife, replied Caderousse, I don't know but what you're right. So you will say nothing? asked the abbé. Why, what good would it do? asked Caderousse. If the poor lad were living, and came to me, and begged that I would candidly tell which were his true and which his false friends, why, perhaps, I should not hesitate. But you tell me he is no more, and therefore can have nothing to do with hatred or revenge, so let all such feeling be buried with him. You prefer them, said the abbé, that I should bestow on men you say are false and treacherous the reward intended for faithful friendship. That is true enough, returned Caderousse. You say truly, the gift of poor Edmond was not meant for such traitors as Fanon and Anglars. Besides, what would it be to them? No more than a drop of water in the ocean. Remember, chimed in La Carconte, those two could crush you at a single blow. How so? inquired the abbé. Are these persons then so rich and powerful? Do you not know their history? I do not. Pray relate it to me. Caderousse seemed to reflect for a few moments, then said, No, truly, it would take up too much time. Well, my good friend, returned the abbé, in a tone that indicated utter indifference on his part, you are at liberty either to speak or to be silent, just as you please. For my own part, I respect your scruples and admire your sentiments, so let the matter end. I shall do my duty as conscientiously as I can, and fulfil my promise to the dying man. My first business will be to dispose of this diamond. So saying, the abbé again drew the small box from his pocket, opened it, and contrived to hold it in such a light that a bright flash of brilliant hues passed before the dazzled eyes of Caderousse. "'Wife! wife!' cried he in a hoarse voice. "'Come here!' "'Diamond!' exclaimed La Carconte, rising and descending to the chamber with a tolerably firm step. "'What diamond are you talking about?' Why, did you not hear all we said? inquired Caderousse. It is a beautiful diamond, left by poor Edmond Dantes, to be sold, and the money divided between his father, Mercedes, his betrothed bride, Fernand Danglars, and myself. The jewel is worth at least fifty thousand francs. Oh, what a magnificent jewel! cried the astonished woman. The fifth part of the profits from this stone belongs to us, then, does it not? asked Caderousse. It does, replied the abbe with the addition of an equal division of that part intended for the elder Dantes, which I believe myself at liberty to divide equally with the four survivors. And why among us four? inquired Caderousse. As being the friend is more esteemed and most faithful and devoted to him. I don't call those friends who betray and ruin you, murmured the wife in her turn, in a low, muttering voice. Of course not, rejoined Caderousse quickly. No more do I, and that was what I was observing to this gentleman just now. I said I looked upon it as a sacrilegious profanation to reward treachery, perhaps crime. Remember, answered the abbé calmly, as he replaced the jewel and its case in the pocket of his cassock. It is your fault, not mine, that I do so. You will have the goodness to furnish me with the address of both Fanon and Anglars, in order that I may execute Edmond's last wishes. The agitation of Caderousse became extreme, and large drops of perspiration rolled from his heated brow. He saw the abbé rise from his seat and go towards the door, as though to ascertain if his horse was sufficiently refreshed to continue his journey. Caderousse and his wife exchanged looks of deep meaning. "'There you see, wife,' said the former, "'this splendid diamond might all be ours, if we chose. Do you believe it? Why, surely, a man of his holy profession would not deceive us?' "'Well,' replied La Carconte, "'do as you like. For my part, I wash my hands of the affair.' So saying, she once more climbed the staircase leading to her chamber, her body convulsed with chills, and her teeth rattling in her head, in spite of the intense heat of the weather. Arrived at the top stair, she turned around, and called out in a warning tone to her husband, "'Gaspard, consider well what you are about to do.' "'I have both reflected and decided,' answered he. 
La Carconte then entered her chamber, the flooring of which creaked beneath her heavy, uncertain tread, as she proceeded towards her armchair, into which she fell as though exhausted. Well, asked the abbe, as he returned to the apartment below, what have you made up your mind to do? To tell you all I know, was the reply. I certainly think you act wisely in so doing, said the priest. Not because I have the least desire to learn anything you may please to conceal from me, but simply that if, through your assistance, I could distribute the legacy according to the wishes of the testator, why so much the better, that is all. I hope it may be so, replied Caderousse, his face flushed with cupidity. I am all attention, said the abbé. Stop a minute, answered Caderousse. We might be interrupted in the most interesting part of my story, which would be a pity, and it is as well that your visit hither should be made known only to ourselves. With these words he went stealthily to the door, which he closed, and, by way of still greater precaution, bolted and barred it, as he was accustomed to do at night. During this time the abbé had chosen his place for listening at his ease. He removed his seat into a corner of the room, where he himself would be in deep shadow, while the light would be fully thrown on the narrator. Then, with head bent down and hands clasped, or rather clinched together, he repaired to give his whole attention to Caderousse, who seated himself on the little stool exactly opposite to him. "'Remember, this is no affair of mine,' said the trembling voice of La Carconte, as though through the flooring of her chamber she viewed the scene that was enacting below. "'Enough, enough,' replied Caderousse. "'Say no more about it. I will take all the consequences upon myself.' And he began his story. End of chapter 26This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Vacher of Mattapoisett, Massachusetts. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 27 The Story. First, sir, said Caderousse, you must make me a promise. What is that? inquired the abbey. Why, if you ever make use of the details I am about to give you, that you will never let anyone know that it was I who supplied them, for the persons of whom I am about to talk are rich and powerful, and if they only laid the tips of their fingers on me I should break to pieces like glass. Make yourself easy, my friend, replied the abbey. I am a priest, and confessions die in my breast. Recollect, our only desire is to carry out, in a fitting manner, the last wishes of our friend. Speak, then, without reserve, as without hatred. Tell the truth, the whole truth. I do not know, never may know, the persons of whom you are about to speak. Besides, I am an Italian, and not a Frenchman, and belong to God, and not to men, and I shall shortly retire to my convent, which I have only quitted to fulfill the last wishes of a dying man. This positive assurance seemed to give Caderousse a little courage. Well, then, under these circumstances, said Caderousse, I will, I even believe I ought, to undeceive you as to the friendship which poor Edmund thought so sincere and unquestionable. Begin with his father, if you please, said the abbey. Edmund talked to me a great deal about the old man for whom he had the deepest love. The history is a sad one, said Caderousse, shaking his head. Perhaps you know all the earlier parts of it? Yes answered the abbey. Edmund related to me everything until the moment when he was arrested in a small cabaret close to Marseilles. At La Reserve? Oh, yes, I can see it. All before me this moment. Was it not his betrothal feast? It was, and the feast that began so gaily had a very sorrowful ending. A police commissary, followed by four soldiers, entered, and Dante's was arrested. Yes, and up to this point I know all, said the priest. Dante's himself only knew that which personally concerned him, for he never beheld again the five persons I have named to you, or heard mention of any of them. Well, when Dante's was arrested, Monsieur Morel hastened to obtain the particulars, and they were very sad. The old man returned alone to his home, folded up his wedding suit with tears in his eyes, and paced up and down his chamber the whole day, and would not go to bed at all, for I was underneath him and heard him walking the whole night. And for myself, I assure you, I could not sleep either, for the grief of the poor father gave me uneasiness, and every step he took went to my heart as really as if his foot had pressed against my breast. 
The next day Mercedes came to implore the protection of Monsieur de Villefort. She did not obtain it, however, and went to visit the old man. When she saw him so miserable and heartbroken, having passed a sleepless night and not touched food since the previous day, she wished him to go with her that she might take care of him. But the old man would not consent. No, was the old man's reply. I will not leave this house, for my poor dear boy loves me better than anything in the world, and if he gets out of prison he will come and see me the first thing. And what would he think if I did not wait here for him? I heard all this from the window, for I was anxious that Mercedes should persuade the old man to accompany her, for his footsteps over my head all night and day did not leave me a moment's repose. But did you not go upstairs and try to console the poor old man? asked the abbey. Ah, sir, replied Caderousse, we cannot console those who will not be consoled, and he was one of these, besides. I know not why, but he seemed to dislike seeing me. One night, however, I heard his sobs, and I could not resist my desire to go up to him. But when I reached his door, he was no longer weeping, but praying. I cannot now repeat to you, sir, all the eloquent words and imploring language you made use of. It was more than piety, it was more than grief, and I, who am no cantor, and hate the Jesuits, said then to myself, It is really well, and I am very glad that I have not any children, for if I were a father and felt such excessive grief as the old man does, and did not find in my memory or heart all that he is now saying, I should throw myself into the sea at once, for I could not bear it. Poor father, murmured the priest. From day to day he lived on alone, and more and more solitary. Monsieur Morel and Mercedes came to see him, but his door was closed, and although I was certain he was at home, he would not make any answer. One day, when, contrary to his custom, he had admitted Mercedes, and the poor girl, in spite of her own grief and despair, endeavored to console him, he said to her, Be assured, my dear daughter, he is dead, and instead of expecting him, it is he who is awaiting us. I am quite happy, for I am the oldest, and of course shall see him first. However well disposed a person may be, you will see why we leave off after a time seeing persons who are in sorrow. They make one melancholy, and so at last old Dantes was left all to himself, and I only saw from time to time strangers go up to him and come down again with some bundle they tried to hide. But I guess what these bundles were, in that he sold by degrees what he had to, to pay for his sustenance. At length the poor old fellow reached the end of all he had. He owed three-quarters rent and they threatened to turn him out. He begged for another week, which was granted to him. I know this, because the landlord came into my apartment when he left his. For the first three days I heard him walking about as usual, but on the fourth I heard nothing. I then resolved to go up to him at all risks. The door was closed, but I looked through the keyhole, and saw him so pale and haggard, that believing him very ill, I went and told Monsieur Morel, and then ran on to Mercedes. They both came immediately, Monsieur Morel bringing a doctor, and the doctor said it was inflammation of the bowels, and ordered him a limited diet. I was there, too, and I shall never forget the old man's smile at this prescription. From that time he received all who came. He had an excuse for not eating any more. A doctor had put him on a diet. The abbey uttered a kind of groan. The story interests you, does it not, sir? inquired Gadarus. Yes, replied the abbey. It is very affecting. Mercedes came again, and she found him so altered that she was even more anxious than before to have him taken to her own home. This was Monsieur Morel's wish also, who would fain have conveyed the old man against his consent. But the old man resisted and cried so that they were actually frightened. Mercedes remained, therefore, by his bedside, and Monsieur Morel went away, making a sign to the Catalan that he had left his purse on the chimney-piece. But availing himself of the doctor's order, the old man would not take any sustenance. At length, after nine days of despair and fasting, the old man died, cursing those who had caused his misery, and saying to Mercedes, If you ever see my Edmund again, tell him I die blessing him. The abbey rose from his chair, made two turns round the chamber, and pressed his trembling hand against his parched throat. And you believe he died... Of hunger, sir, of hunger, said Caderousse. I am as certain of it as that we two are Christians. The abbey, with a shaking hand, seized the glass of water that was standing by him half full, swallowed it at one gulp, and then resumed his seat, with red eyes and pale cheeks. This was indeed a horrid event, said he in a hoarse voice. The more so, sir, as it was men's and not God's doing. "'Tell me of those men,' said the abbey, "'and remember, too,' he added in an almost menacing tone, 
You have promised to tell me everything. Tell me, therefore, who are these men who killed the son with despair and the father with famine? Two men jealous of him, sir, one from love and the other from ambition, Fernand and Danglars. How is this jealousy manifested? Speak on. They denounced Edmund as a Bonapartist agent. Which of the two denounced him? Which was the real delinquent? Both, sir. One with the letter, and the other put it in the post. And where was this letter written? At La Reserve, the day before the betrothal feast. Twas so, then, twas so, then, murmured the abbey. Oh, Faria, Faria, how well did you judge men and things? What did you please to say, sir? Uh, nothing, nothing, replied the priest. Go on. It was Danglars who wrote the denunciation with his left hand, that his writing might not be recognized and Fernand, who put it in the post. But, exclaimed the abbey suddenly, you were there yourself. I, said Caderousse, astonished, who told you I was there? The abbey saw he had overshot the mark, and he added quickly, No one, but in order to have known everything so well, you must have been an eyewitness. True, true, said Caderousse in a choking voice, I was there. And did you not remonstrate against such infamy, asked the abbey? If not, you were an accomplice. Sir, replied Caderousse, they had made me drink to such an excess that I nearly lost all perception. I had only an indistinct understanding of what was passing around me. I said all that a man in such a state could say, but they both assured me that it was a jest they were carrying on, and perfectly harmless. Next day, next day, sir, you must have seen plain enough what they had been doing, yet you said nothing, though you were present when Dantes was arrested. Yes, sir. I was there, and very anxious to speak, but Danglars restrained me. If he should really be guilty, said he, and did really put into the island of Elba, if he is really charged with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee at Paris, and if they find this letter upon him, those who have supported him will pass for his accomplices. I confess I had my fears in the state in which politics then were, and I held my tongue. It was cowardly, I confess, but it was not criminal. I understand. You allowed matters to take their course, that was all. Yes, sir, answered Caderousse, and remorse preys on me night and day. I often ask pardon of God, I swear to you, because this action, the only one with which I have seriously to reproach myself in all my life, is no doubt the cause of my abject condition. I am expiating a moment of selfishness, and so I always say to La Carconte, when she complains, Hold your tongue, woman. It is the will of God. And Caderousse bowed his head with every sign of real repentance. Well, sir, said the abbe, you have spoken unreservedly, and thus to accuse yourself is to deserve pardon. Unfortunately, Edmund is dead and has not pardoned me. He did not know, said the abbe. But he knows it all now, interrupted Caderousse. They say the dead know everything. There was a brief silence. The abbe rose and paced up and down pensively and then resumed his seat. "'You have two or three times mentioned a Monsieur Morel,' he said. "'Who is he? The owner of the Pharaon and patron of Dante's.' "'And what part did he play in this sad drama?' inquired the abbey. "'The part of an honest man, full of courage and real regard. Twenty times he interceded for Edmund. When the emperor returned, he wrote, implored, threatened, and so energetically that on the second restoration he was persecuted as a Bonapartist. Ten times, as I told you, he came to see Dante's father, and offered to receive him in his own house, and the night or two before his death, as I have already said, he left his purse on the mantelpiece, with which they paid the old man's debts, and buried him decently, and so Edmund's father died, as he had lived, without doing harm to anyone. I have the purse still by me, a large one, made of red silk. And, asked the abbe, is Monsieur Morel still alive? Yes, replied Caderousse. In that case, replied the abbey, he should be rich and happy. Caderousse smiled bitterly. Yes, happy as myself, said he. What? Monsieur Morel unhappy? exclaimed the abbey. He is reduced almost to the last extremity. Nay, he is almost at the point of dishonor. How? Yes, continued Caderousse, so it is. After five and twenty years of labor, after having acquired a most honorable name in the trade of Marseille, Monsieur Morel is utterly ruined. He has lost five ships in two years, has suffered by the bankruptcy of three large houses, and his only hope now is in that very pharaon which poor Dantes commanded, 
and which is expected from the Indies with a cargo of cochineal and indigo. If this ship founders like the others, he is a ruined man. And has the unfortunate man wife or children? inquired the abbey. Yes, he has a wife, who through everything has behaved like an angel. He has a daughter, who is about to marry the man she loved, but whose family now will not allow him to wed the daughter of a ruined man. And he has besides a son, a lieutenant in the army, and as you may suppose, all this, instead of lessening, only augments his sorrows. If he were alone in the world, he would blow out his brains, and there would be an end. Horrible, ejaculated the priest. And it is thus heaven recompenses virtue, sir, added Caderousse. You see, I, who never did a bad action but that I have told you of, am in destitution with my poor wife dying a fever before my very eyes, and I unable to do anything in the world for her. I shall die of hunger, as old Dante's did, while Fernand and Danglars are rolling in wealth. How is that? Because their deeds have brought them good fortune, while honest men have been reduced to misery. What has become of Danglars, the instigator, and therefore the most guilty? What has become of him? Why, he left Marseilles and was taken on the recommendation of Monsieur Morel, who did not know his crime, as cashier into a Spanish bank. During the war with Spain he was employed in the commissariat of the French army, and made a fortune. Then with that money he speculated in the funds, and trebled or quadrupled his capital, and having first married his banker's daughter, who left him a widower, he has married a second time a widow, a Madame de Nargon, daughter of Monsieur de Servieux, the king's chamberlain, who is in high favor at court. He is now a millionaire, and they have made him a baron. And now he is the Baron Danglars, with a fine residence in the Rue de Mont Blanc, with ten horses in his stables, six footmen in his antechamber, and I know not how many millions in his strong box. Ah, uh, said the abbe in a peculiar tone, he is happy. Happy? Who can answer for that? Happiness or unhappiness is the secret known but to oneself and the walls. Walls have ears but no tongues. But if a large fortune produces happiness, Danglars is happy. And Fernand? Fernand? Why, much the same story. But how could a poor Catalan fisher boy without education or resources make a fortune? I confess this staggers me. And it has staggered everyone. There must have been in his life some strange secret that no one knows. But then, by what visible steps has he attained this high fortune, or high position? Both, sir. He has both fortune and position. Both. This must be impossible. It would seem so. But listen, and you will understand. Some days before the return of the emperor, Fernand was drafted. The Bourbons let him quietly enough at the Catalans, but when Napoleon returned, a special levy was made, and Fernand was compelled to join. I went too, but as I was older than Fernand, and had just married my poor wife, I was only sent to the coast. Fernand was enrolled in the active troop, went to the frontier with his regiment, and was at the Battle of Ligny. The night after the battle, he was sent at the door of a general who carried on a secret correspondence with the enemy. That same night, the general was to go over to the English. He proposed to Fernand to accompany him. Fernand agreed to do so, deserted his post, and followed the general. Fernand would have been court-martialed if Napoleon had remained on the throne, but his action was rewarded by the Bourbons. He returned to France with, with the épaulet of sub-lieutenant, and as the protection of the general, who is in the highest favor, was accorded to him, he was a captain in 1823, during the Spanish War, that is to say, at the time when Danglars made his early speculations. Fernand was a Spaniard, and being sent to Spain to ascertain the feeling of his fellow countrymen, found Danglars there, but on very intimate terms with him, went over the support of the royalists of the capital and in the provinces, received promises and made pledges on his own part, guided his regiment by paths known to himself alone through the mountain gorges which were held by the royalists, and in fact rendered such services in this brief campaign that after the taking of Trocadero he was made colonel and received the title of Count and the cross of an officer of the Legion of Honor. Destiny, destiny, murmured the abbey. Yes, but listen, this was not all. The war with Spain being ended, Fernand's career was checked by the long peace which seemed likely to endure throughout Europe. Greece only had risen against Turkey and had begun her war of independence. All eyes were turned towards Athens. It was the fashion to pity and support the Greeks. 
The French government, without protecting them openly, as you know, gave countenance to volunteer assistance. Fernand sought and obtained leave to go and serve in Greece, still having his name kept on the army roll. Some time after, it was stated that the Comte de Morcerf, this was the name he bore, had entered the service of Ali Pasha with the rank of Instructor General. Ali Pasha was killed, as you know, but before he died he recompensed the services of Fernand by leaving him a considerable sum, with which he returned to France when he was gazetted Lieutenant General. So that now, inquired the Abbey, so that now, continued Caderousse, he owns a magnificent house, Nombre Vance, Rue de Elder, Paris. The Abbey opened his mouth, hesitated for a moment, then making an effort at self-control, he said, And Mercedes, they tell me that she has disappeared. Disappeared? said Caderousse. Yes. As the sun disappears, to rise the next day with still more splendor. Has she made a fortune also? inquired the Abbey, with an ironical smile. "'Mercedes is at this moment one of the greatest ladies in Paris,' replied Caderousse. "'Go on,' said the Abbey. "'It seems as if I were listening to the story of a dream, "'but I have seen things so extraordinary that what you tell me "'seems less astonishing than it otherwise might.' "'Mercedes was at first in the deepest despair at the blow which deprived her of Edmund. "'I have told you of her attempts to propitiate Monsieur de Villefort, "'her devotion to the elder Dantes, in the midst of her despair, a new affliction overtook her. This was the departure of Fernand, a Fernand whose crime she did not know, and whom she regarded as her brother. Fernand went, and Mercedes remained alone. Three months passed, and still she wept. No news of Edmund, no news of Fernand, no companionship save that of an old man who was dying with despair. One evening, after a day of accustomed vigil at the angle of two roads, leading to Marseilles from the Catalans, she returned to her home, more depressed than ever. Suddenly she heard a step she knew, turned anxiously around. The door opened, and Fernand, dressed in the uniform of a sub-lieutenant, stood before her. It was not the one she wished for most, but it seemed as if a part of her past life had returned to her. Mercedes seized Fernand's hands with a transport which he took for love, but which was only joy at being no longer alone in the world, and seeing at last a friend, after long hours of solitary sorrow, and then, it must be confessed, Fernand had never been hated. He was only not precisely loved. Another possessed Sol Mercedes' heart. That other was absent, had disappeared, perhaps was dead. At this last thought, Mercedes burst into a flood of tears and wrung her hands in agony, but the thought, which she had always repelled before when it was suggested to her by another, came now in full force upon her mind. And then, too, old Dantes incessantly said to her, our Edmund is dead. If he were not, he would return to us. The old man died, as I have told you. Had he lived, Mercedes, perchance, had not become the wife of another, for he would have been there to reproach her infidelity. Fernand saw this, and when he learned of the old man's death, he returned. He was now lieutenant. At his first coming, he had not said a word of love to Mercedes. At the second, he reminded her that he loved her. Mercedes begged for six months more in which to await and mourn for Edmund. So that, said the Abbey with a bitter smile, that makes eighteen months in all. What more could the most devoted lover desire? Then he murmured the words of the English poet, Frailty, thy name is woman. Six months afterward, continued Caderousse, the marriage took place in the church of Acuse. The very church in which she was to have married Edmund, murmured the priest. There was only a change of bridegrooms. Well, Mercedes was married, proceeded Caderousse. But although in the eyes of the world she appeared calm, she nearly fainted as she passed La Reserve, where eighteen months before the betrothal had been celebrated with him whom she might have known she still loved had she looked to the bottom of her heart. Fernand more happy, but not more at his ease, for I saw it at this time he was in constant dread of Edmund's return. Fernand was very anxious to get his wife away and to depart himself. There were too many unpleasant possibilities associated with the Catalans, and eight days after the wedding they left Marseilles. "'Did you ever see Mercedes again?' inquired the priest. "'Yes, during the Spanish war at Perpignan, where Fernand had left her, she was attending to the education of her son.' The abbey started. "'Her son?' said he. "'Yes,' replied Caderousse. "'Little Albert.' "'But, then, to be able to instruct her child,' continued the abbey, "'she must have received an education herself. I understood from Edmund that she was the daughter of a simple fisherman, beautiful but uneducated.' 
Oh, replied Caderousse, did he know so little of his lovely betrothed? Mercedes might have been a queen, sir, if the, qu if the crown were to be placed on the heads of the loveliest and most intelligent. Fernand's fortune was already waxing great, and she developed with his growing fortune. She learned drawing, music, everything. Besides, I believe, between ourselves, she did this in order to distract her mind, that she might forget, and she only filled her head in order to alleviate the weight on her heart. But now her position in life is assured, continued Caderousse. No doubt fortune and honors have comforted her. She is rich, a countess, and yet, Caderousse paused, and yet what? asked the abbey. Yet I am sure she is not happy, said Caderousse. What makes you believe this? Why, when I found myself utterly destitute, I thought my old friends would perhaps assist me. So I went to danglers, who would not even receive me. I called on Fernand, who sent me a hundred francs by his valet de chambre. Then you did not see either of them? No. But Madame de Morcerf saw me. How was that? As I went away, a purse fell at my feet. It contained five and twenty louis. I raised my head quickly and saw Mercedes, who at once shut the blind. "'And Monsieur de Villefort?' asked the abbey. "'Oh, he never was a friend of mine. I did not know him, and I had nothing to ask of him. "'Do you not know what became of him and the share he had in Edmund's misfortunes?' "'No, I only know that some time after Edmund's arrest he married Mademoiselle de saint Meron, "'and soon after left Marseilles. "'No doubt he has been as lucky as the rest. "'No doubt he is as rich as Danglars, as high in station as Fernand. "'I only, as you see, have remained poor, wretched, and forgotten.' "'You are mistaken, my friend,' replied the abbey. "'God may seem sometimes to forget for a time while his justice reposes, "'but there always comes a moment when he remembers, and behold, a proof.' "'As he spoke, the abbey took the diamond from his pocket, "'and, giving it to Caderousse, said, "'Here, my friend, take this diamond. It is yours.' "'What? For me only?' cried Caderousse. "'Ah, oh, sir, do not jest with me.' "'This diamond was to have been shared among his friends. "'Edmund had one friend only.' and thus it cannot be divided. Take the diamond, then, and sell it. It is worth fifty thousand francs, and I repeat my wish that this sum may suffice to release you from your wretchedness. Oh, sir, said Caderousse, putting out one hand timidly, and with the other wiping away the perspiration which bedewed his brow. Oh, sir, do not make jests of the happiness or despair of a man. I know what happiness and what despair are, and I never make a jest of such feelings. Take it, then, but in exchange— Caderousse, who touched the diamond, withdrew his hand. The abbey smiled. In exchange, he continued, give me the red silk purse that Monsieur Morel left on old Dante's chimney piece, and which you tell me is still in your hands. Caderousse, more and more astonished, went toward a large oaken cupboard, opened it, and gave the abbey a long purse of faded red silk, round which were two copper runners that had once been gilt. The abbey took it, and in return gave Caderousse the diamond. "'Oh, you are a man of God, sir,' cried Caderousse, "'for no one knew that Edmund had given you this diamond, and you might have kept it.' "'Which,' said the abbey to himself, "'you would have done.' The abbey rose, took his hat and gloves. "'Well,' he said, "'all you have told me is perfectly true, then, and I may believe it in every particular?' "'See, sir,' replied Caderousse, "'in this corner is a crucifix in holy wood. Here on this shelf is my wife's testament. Open this book.' and I will swear upon it with my hand on the crucifix. I will swear to you by my soul's salvation, my faith as a Christian. I have told everything to you as it occurred, and as the recording angel will tell it to the ear of God at the day of the last judgment. "'Tis well," said the abbey, convinced by his manner and tone that Caderousse spoke the truth. "'Tis well, and may this money profit you. Adieu. I go far from men who thus so bitterly injure each other. The abbey with difficulty got away from the enthusiastic thanks of Caderousse, opened the door himself, got out, and mounted his horse, once more saluted the innkeeper, who kept uttering his loud farewells, and then returned by the road he had travelled in coming. When Caderousse turned around, he saw behind him La Carconte, paler and trembling more than ever. "'Is, then, all that I have heard really true?' she inquired. "'What, that he has given the diamond to us only?' inquired Caderousse. "'Half bewildered with joy? Yes. Nothing more true. See, here it is.' The woman gazed at it a moment, and then said, in a gloomy voice, "'Suppose it's false?' And Caderousse started and turned pale. "'False?' he muttered. "'False? Why should that man give me a false diamond? "'To get your secret without paying for it, you blockhead.' 
Caderousse remained for a moment aghast under the weight of such an idea. Oh, he said, taking up his hat, which he placed on the red handkerchief tied round his head, we will soon find out. In what way? Why, the fair is on at Beaucaire. There are always jewelers from Paris there, and I will show it to them. Look after the house, wife, and I shall be back in two hours. And Caderousse left the house in haste, and ran rapidly in the direction opposite to that which the priests had taken. Fifty thousand francs, muttered La Carconte, when left alone. It is a large sum of money, but it is not a fortune. End of chapter 27「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March 16, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 28. The Prison Register. The day after that in which the scene we have just described had taken place on the road between Bellegarde and Beaucaire, a man of about thirty, or two and thirty, dressed in a bright blue frock coat, nankeen trousers, and a white waistcoat, having the appearance and accent of an Englishman, presented himself before the mayor of Marseilles. Sir, said he, I am chief clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome. We are, and have been these ten years, connected with the house of Morel and son of Marseilles. We have a hundred thousand francs or thereabouts loaned on their securities, and we are a little uneasy at the reports which have reached us that the firm is on the brink of ruin. I have come, therefore, express from Rome, to ask you for information. Sir, replied the mayor, I know very well that during the last four or five years misfortune has seemed to pursue Monsieur Morel. He has lost four or five vessels, and has suffered by three or four bankruptcies, but it is not for me, although I am a creditor myself to the amount of ten thousand francs, to give any information as to the state of his finances. Ask me, as mayor, what is my opinion of Monsieur Morel, and I shall say that he is a man honorable to the last degree, and who has, up to this time, fulfilled every engagement with scrupulous punctuality. That is all I can say, sir. If you wish to know more, address yourself to Monsieur de Beauville, the inspector of prisons, number 15, Rue de Nouet. He has, I believe, two hundred thousand francs in Morel's hands, and if there be any grounds for apprehension, as this is a greater amount than mine, you will most probably find him better informed than myself. The Englishman seemed to appreciate this extreme delicacy, made his bow, and went away, proceeding with the characteristic British stride toward the street mentioned. Monsieur de Beauvais was in his private room, and the Englishman, on perceiving him, made a gesture of surprise which seemed to indicate that it was not the first time he had been in his presence. As to Monsieur de Beauvais, he was in such a state of despair that it was evident that all the faculties of his mind, absorbed in the thought which occupied them at the moment, did not allow either his memory or his imagination to stray into the past. The Englishman, with the coolness of his nation, addressed him in terms nearly similar to those with which he had accosted the mayor of Marseilles. "'Oh, sir!' exclaimed Monsieur de Beauvais. "'Your fears are unfortunately but too well founded. And you see before you a man in despair. I had two hundred thousand francs placed in the hands of Morel and son. These two hundred thousand francs were the dowry of my daughter, who was to be married in a fortnight, and these two hundred thousand francs were payable half on the fifteenth of this month, the other half on the fifteenth of next month. I had informed Monsieur Morel of my desire to have these payments punctually, and he has been here within the last half hour to tell me that if his ship, the Pharaon, does not come into port on the fifteenth, he will be wholly unable to make this payment. But, said the Englishman, this looks very much like a suspension of payment. It looks more like bankruptcy, exclaimed Monsieur de Beauville despairingly. The Englishman appeared to reflect a moment, and said, from which it would appear, sir, that this credit inspires you with considerable apprehension. To tell the truth, I consider it lost. Well, then, I will buy it of you. You? Yes, I. 
but at a tremendous discount, of course. No, for two hundred thousand francs. Our house, added the Englishman with a laugh, does not do things that way. And you will pay? Ready money. And the Englishman withdrew from his pocket a bundle of banknotes, which might have been twice the sum Monsieur de Beauville feared to lose. A ray of joy passed across Monsieur de Beauville's countenance, yet he made an effort at self-control, and said, "'Sir, I ought to tell you that, in all probability, you will not realize six per cent of this sum.' "'That's no affair of mine,' replied the Englishman. "'That is the affair of the houses of Thompson and French, in whose name I act. They have, perhaps, some motive to serve in hastening the ruin of a rival firm, but all I know, sir, is that I am ready to hand you over this sum in exchange for your assignment of the debt. I only ask a brokerage. Well, of course, that is perfectly just, cried Monsieur de Beauville. The commission is usually one and a half. Will you have two, three, five per cent, even more, whatever you say? Sir, replied the Englishman, laughing, I am like my house. I do not do such things. No, the commission that I ask is quite different. Name it, sir, I beg. You are the inspector of prisons? I have been so these fourteen years. You keep the registers of entries and departures? I do. To these registers there are added notes relative to the prisoners? There are special reports on every prisoner. Well, sir, I was educated at home by a poor devil of an abbe who disappeared suddenly. I have since learned that he was confined in the Chateau d'If, and I should like to learn some particulars of his death. What was his name? The Abbe Faria. Oh, I recall him perfectly, cried Monsieur de Beauville. He was crazy. So they said. Oh, he was, decidedly. Very possibly. What sort of madness was it? He pretended to know of an immense treasure, and offered vast sums to the government if they would liberate him. Poor devil! And he is dead? Yes, sir, five or six months ago, last February. You have a good memory, sir, to recall dates so well. I recall this because the poor devil's death was accompanied by a singular incident. May I ask what that was? said the Englishman with an expression of curiosity which a close observer would have been astonished at discovering in his phlegmatic countenance. Oh, dear, yes, sir, the abbe's dungeon was forty or fifty feet distant from that which one of Bonaparte's emissaries, one of those who had contributed the most to the return of the usurper in 1815, a very resolute and very dangerous man. Indeed, said the Englishman. Yes, replied Monsieur de Beauville. I myself had occasion to see this man in 1816 or 1817, and we could only go into his dungeon with a file of soldiers. That man made a deep impression on me. I shall never forget his countenance." The Englishman smiled imperceptibly. "'As you say, sir,' he interposed, "'that the two dungeons were separated by a distance of fifty feet, but it appears that this Edmond Dantes this dangerous man's name was Edmond Dantes. It appears, sir, that this Edmond Dantes had procured tools, or had made them, for they found a tunnel through which the prisoners held communication with one another. This tunnel was dug, no doubt, with an intention of escape? No doubt. But unfortunately for the prisoners, the Abbe Fari had an attack of catalepsy and died. That must have cut short the projects of escape. Well, for the dead man, yes replied Monsieur de Beauville. But not for the survivor. On the contrary, this Dante saw a means of accelerating his escape. He no doubt thought that prisoners who died in the Chateau d'If were interred in an ordinary burial ground, and he conveyed the dead man into his own cell, took his place in the sack in which they sewed up the corpse, and awaited the moment of interment. It was a bold step, one that showed some courage, remarked the Englishman. As I have already told you, sir, he was a very dangerous man, and fortunately by his own act disembarrassed the government of the fears it had on his account. How was that? How? Do you not comprehend? No. The Chateau d'If has no cemetery. They simply throw the dead into the sea after fastening a thirty-six-pound cannonball to their feet. Well, 
observed the Englishman, as if he were slow of comprehension. Well, they fastened a thirty-six-pound ball to his feet and threw him into the sea. Really? exclaimed the Englishman. Yes, sir, continued the inspector of prisons. You may imagine the amazement of the fugitive when he found himself flung headlong over the rocks. I should like to have seen his face at that moment. That would have been difficult. No matter, replied de Beauvais, in supreme good humor at the certainty of recovering his two hundred thousand francs. No matter, I can fancy it. And he shouted with laughter. So can I, said the Englishman. And he laughed, too. But he laughed as the English do, at the end of his teeth. And so, continued the Englishman, who first gained his composure, he has drowned? Unquestionably. So that the governor got rid of the dangerous and the crazy prisoner at the same time. Precisely. But some official document was drawn up as to this affair, I suppose, inquired the Englishman. Yes, yes. The mortuary deposition. You understand Dante's relations, if he had any, might have some interest in knowing if he were dead or alive. So that now, if there were anything to inherit from him, they might do it with easy conscience. He is dead, and no mistake about it. Oh, yes, and they may have the fact attested whenever they please. So be it, said the Englishman. But to return to these registers, true, the story has diverted our attention from them. Excuse me. Excuse you for what? For the story? By no means. It really seems to me very curious. Yes, indeed. So, sir, you wish to see all relating to the poor Abbe, who really was gentleness itself? Yes, you will much oblige me. Go into the study there, and I will show it to you. And they both entered Monsieur de Beauvais's study. Everything there arranged in perfect order. Each register had its number each file of papers its place. The inspector begged the Englishman to seat himself in an armchair, and placed before him the register and documents relative to the Chateau d'If, giving him all the time he desired for the examination, while de Beauvais seated himself in a corner and began to read his newspaper. The Englishman easily found the entries relative to the Abbe Faria, but it seemed that the history which the inspector had related interested him greatly, for, after having pursued the first documents, he turned over the leaves until he reached the deposition regarding Edmund Dantes. There he found everything arranged in due order. The accusation, examination, Morel's petition, Monsieur de Villefort's marginal notes. He folded up the accusation quietly and put it as quietly in his pocket, read the examination, and saw that the name of Nortier was not mentioned in it, perused, too, the application dated 10th April, 1815, in which Morel, by the deputy procurer's advice, exaggerated with the best of intentions, for Napoleon was then on the throne, the services Dantes had rendered to the imperial cause services which Villefort's certificates rendered indispensable. Then he saw through the whole thing. This petition to Napoleon, kept back by Villefort, to become, under the Second Restoration, a terrible weapon against him in the hands of the King's attorney. He was no longer astonished when he searched on to find in the register this note, placed in a bracket against his name. Edmund Dantes an inveterate Bonapartist, took an active part in the return from the island of Elba, to be kept in strict solitary confinement, and to be closely watched and guarded. Beneath these lines was written in another hand, See note above, nothing can be done. He compared the writing in the bracket with the writing of the certificate placed beneath Morel's petition, and discovered that the note in the bracket was in the same writing as the certificate. That is to say, it was Villefort's handwriting. As to the note which accompanied this, the Englishman understood that it might have been added by some inspector, who had taken a momentary interest in Dante's situation, but who had, from the remarks we have quoted, found it impossible to give any effect to the interest he had felt. 
As we have said, the inspector, from discretion, and that he might not disturb the Abbe Faria's pupil in his researches, had seated himself in a corner, and was reading Le Drapeau Blanc. He did not see the Englishman fold up and place in his pocket the accusation written by Danglars under the arbor of La Reserve, and which had the postmark Marseille, 27th February, delivery 6 o'clock p.m. But it must be said that, if he had seen it, he attached so little importance to this scrap of paper and so much importance to his two hundred thousand francs that he would not have opposed whatever the Englishman might do. However, irregular it might be. "'Thanks,' said the latter, closing the register with a slam. "'I have all I want. Now it is for me to perform my promise. Give me a simple assignment of your debt, acknowledge therein the receipt of the cash, and I will hand over to you the money.' He rose and gave his seat to M. Beauvy, who took it without ceremony, and quickly drew up the required assignment, while the Englishman counted out the banknotes on the other side of the desk. So ends Chapter 28, The Prison Register. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 28th, 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 29. The House of Morel and Son. Anyone who had quitted Marseilles a few years previously, well acquainted with the interior of Morel's warehouse, and had returned at this date, would have found a great change. Instead of that air of life, of comfort, and of happiness that permeates a flourishing and prosperous business establishment, instead of merry faces at the windows, busy clerks hurrying to and fro in the long corridors, instead of the court filled with bales of goods re-echoing with the cries and jokes of porters, one would have immediately perceived all aspects of sadness and gloom. Out of all the numerous clerks that used to fill the deserted corridor and the empty office, but two remained. One was a young man of three or four and twenty, who was in love with Monsieur Morel's daughter, and had remained with him in spite of the efforts of his friends to induce him to withdraw. The other was an old one-eyed cashier called Cocle or Cockeye, a nickname given him by the young men who used to throng his vast and now almost deserted beehive, and which had so completely replaced his real name that he would not in all probability have replied to any one who addressed him by it. Cocle remained in M. Morel's service, and a most singular change had taken place in his position. He had, at the same time, risen to the rank of cashier, and sunk to the rank of a servant. He was, however, the same Cocle, good, patient, devoted, but inflexible on the subject of arithmetic, the only point on which he would have stirred firm against the world, even against M. Morel, and strong in the multiplication table which he had at his fingers' ends, no matter what scheme or what trap was laid to catch him. In the midst of the disasters that befell the house, Cocley was the only one unmoved. But this did not arise from a want of affection. On the contrary, from a firm conviction. Like the rats that one by one forsake the doomed ship even before the vessel weighs anchor, so all the numerous clerks had by degrees deserted the office and the warehouse. Cocley had seen them go without thinking of inquiring the cause of their departure. Everything was as we have said, a question of arithmetic to Cocles, and during the twenty years he had always seen all payments made with such exactitude that it seemed as impossible to him that the house should stop payment as that it would to a miller that the river that had so long turned his mill should cease to flow. Nothing had as yet occurred to shake Cocles' belief. 
The last month's payment had been made with the most scrupulous exactitude. Coquelet had detected an overbalance of fourteen sous in his cash, and the same evening he had brought them to Monsieur Morel, who, with a melancholy smile, threw them into the almost empty drawer, saying, "'Thanks, Coquelet. You are the pearl of cashiers.' Coquelet went away perfectly happy, for this eulogium of M. Morel, himself the pearl of the honest men of Marseilles, flattered him more than a present of fifty crowns, but since the end of the month M. Morel had passed on many an anxious hour. In order to meet the payments then due, he had collected all his resources, and, fearing lest the report of his distress should get bruited about at Marseilles when he was known to be reduced to such an extremity, he went to the Bocheret Fair to sell his wife's and daughter's jewels and a portion of his plate. By this means the end of the month was past, but his resources were now exhausted. Credit, owing to the reports afloat, was no longer to be had, and to meet the one hundred thousand francs due at the tenth of the present month, and the one hundred thousand francs due on the fifteenth of the next month to M. de Boisville, M. Morel had in reality no hope but the return of the Faron, of whose departure he had learnt from a vessel which had weighed anchor at the same time, and which had already arrived in harbour. But this vessel, like the Farron, came from Calcutta, and had been in for a fortnight, while no intelligence had been received of the Farron. Such was the state of his affairs, when, the day after his interview with M. de Bourville, the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome presented himself at M. Morel's. Emmanuel received him. This young man was alarmed by the appearance of every new face, for every new face might be that of a new creditor, come in anxiety to question the head of the house. The young man, wishing to spare his employer the pain of this interview, questioned the newcomer, but the stranger declared that he had nothing to say to Monsieur Emmanuel, and that his business was with Monsieur Morel in person. Emmanuel sighed and summoned Coquelet. Coquelet appeared, and the young man bade him conduct the stranger to M. Morel's apartment. Coquelet went first, and the stranger followed him. On the staircase they met a beautiful girl of sixteen or seventeen, who looked with anxiety at the stranger. M. Morel is in his room, is he not, Mademoiselle Julie? said the cashier. Yes, I think so, at least, said the young girl hesitatingly. Go and see, Coquelet, if my father is there. "'Announce the gentleman.' "'It will be useless to announce me, mademoiselle,' returned the Englishman. "'Monsieur Morel does not know my name. "'This worthy gentleman has only to announce the confidential clerk of the house of Thompson and French of Rome, "'with whom your father does business.' "'The young girl turned pale and continued to descend, "'while the stranger and Coquelet continued to mount the staircase. "'She entered the office where Emmanuel was, while Coquelet, by the aid of a key he possessed, opened a door in the corner of a landing-place on the second staircase, conducted the stranger into an antechamber, opened a second door, which he closed behind him, and, after having left the clerk of the house of Thompson and French alone, returned and signed to him that he could enter. The Englishman entered, and found Morel seated at a table, turning over the formidable columns of his ledger, which contained the list of his liabilities. At the sight of the stranger, M. Morel closed the ledger, arose, and offered a seat to the stranger, and, when he had seen him seated, resumed to his own chair. Fourteen years had changed the worthy merchant, who, in his thirty-sixth year at the opening of this history, now was in his fiftieth. His hair had turned white, and his sorrow had ploughed deep furrows on his brow, and his look, once so firm and penetrating, was now irresolute and wandering, as if he feared being forced to fix his attention on some particular thought or person. The Englishman looked at him with an air of curiosity, evidently mingled with interest. Monsieur, said Morel, whose uneasiness was increased by this examination, you wish to speak to me? Yes, monsieur. You are aware from where I come? The house of Thompson and French, at least so my cashier tells me. 
He has told you rightly. The house of Thompson and French had three hundred or four hundred thousand francs to pay this month in France, and, knowing your strict punctuality, have collected all the bills bearing your signature, and charged me, as they became due, to present them, and to employ the money otherwise. Morel sighed deeply, and passed his hand over his forehead, which was covered with perspiration. "'So then, sir,' said Morel, "'you hold bills of mine?' "'Yes, and for a considerable sum.' "'What is the amount?' asked Morel, with a voice he strove to render firm. "'Here it is,' said the Englishman, taking a quantity of papers from his pocket. "'An assignment of two hundred thousand francs to our house by Monsieur de Boisville, the inspector of prisons, to whom they are due. "'You acknowledge, of course, that you owe this sum to him?' "'Yes. He placed the money in my hands at four and a half per cent nearly five years ago.' "'When are you to pay?' "'Half the fifteenth of this month, half the fifteenth of next.' "'Just so. And now there are thirty-two thousand five hundred francs payable shortly. They are all signed by you, and assigned to our house by the holders.' "'I recognize them,' said Morel, whose face was suffused, as he thought that, for the first time in his life, he would be unable to honor his own signature. "'Is that all?' "'No.' I have, for the end of the month, these bills, which have been assigned to us by the house of Pascal, and the house of Wilde and Turner of Marseilles, amounting to nearly fifty-five thousand francs, in all two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred francs. It is impossible to describe what Morel suffered during this enumeration. Two hundred and eighty-seven thousand five hundred francs, repeated he. Yes, sir, repeated the Englishman. I will not, continued he, after a moment's silence, conceal from you that, while your probity and exactitude up to this moment are universally acknowledged, yet the report is current in Marseilles that you are not able to meet your liabilities. At this almost brutal speech Morel turned deathly pale. Sir, he said, up to this time, and it is now more than four and twenty years since I received the direction of this house from my father, who had himself conducted it for five and thirty years, never has anything bearing the signature of Morel and Son been dishonored. I know that, replied the Englishman, but as a man of honor you should answer another. Tell me fairly, shall you pay these with the same punctuality? Morel shuddered and looked at the man, who spoke with more assurance than he had hitherto shown. "'To questions frankly put,' said he, "'a straightforward answer should be given. Yes, I shall pay, if, as I hope, my vessel arrives safely, for its arrival will again procure me the credit which the numerous accidents of which I have been the victim have deprived me. But if the Farron should be lost, and this last resource be gone, the poor man's eyes filled with tears. Well, said the other, if this last resource fail you? Well, returned Morel, it is a cruel thing to be forced to say, but already used to misfortune I must habituate myself to shame. I fear I shall be forced to suspend payment. Have you no friends who could assist you? Morel smiled mournfully. In business, sir, said he, one has no friends, only correspondence. It is true, murmured the Englishman. Then you have but one hope. But one. The last? The last. So that if this fail, I am ruined completely ruined. And as I was on my way here, a vessel was coming into port. I know it, sir. A young man who still adheres to my fallen fortune passes a part of his time in a belvedere at the top of the house in hopes of being the first to announce good news to me. He has informed me of the arrival of this ship. And it is not yours? No, she is a Bordeaux vessel. La Gironde. She comes from India also, but she is not mine. Perhaps she has spoken the Farron, and brings you some tidings of her. Shall I tell you plainly one thing, sir? 
I dread almost as much to receive any tidings of my vessel as to remain in doubt. Uncertainty is still hope. Then in a low voice Morel added, This delay is not natural. The Farron left Calcutta 5th of February. She ought to have been here a month ago. What is that? said the Englishman. What is the meaning of that noise? Oh, oh, cried Morel, turning pale. What is it? A loud noise was heard on the stairs of people moving hastily in half-stifled sobs. Morel rose and advanced to the door, but his strength failed him as he sank to the chair. The two men remained opposite one another, Morel trembling in every limb, the stranger gazing at him with an air of profound pity. The noise had ceased, but it seemed that Morel expected something. Something had occasioned the noise, and something must follow. The stranger fancied he heard footsteps on the stairs, and that the footsteps, which were those of several persons, stopped at the door. A key was inserted into the lock of the first door, and the creaking of the hinges was audible. "'There are only two persons who have the key to that door,' murmured Morel, "'Cocles and Julie.' At this instant the second door opened, and the young girl, her eyes bathed with tears, appeared. Morel rose, trembling, supporting himself by the arm of the chair. He would have spoken, but his voice failed him. "'Oh, father,' said she, clasping her hands, "'forgive your child for being the bearer of evil tidings.' Morel again changed color. Julie threw herself into his arms. "'Oh, father, father,' murmured she, "'courage!' "'The Farron has gone down, then,' said Morel in a hoarse voice. The young girl did not speak, but she made an affirmative sign with her head as she lay on her father's breast. "'And the crew?' asked Morel. "'Saved!' said the girl, saved by the crew of the vessel that has just entered the harbor. Morel raised his two hands to heaven with an expression of resignation and sublime gratitude. Thanks, my God, said he, at least thou strikest but me alone. A tear moistened the eye of the phlegmatic Englishman. Come in, come in, said Morel, for I presume you are all at the door. Scarcely had he uttered those words when Madame Morel entered weeping bitterly. Emmanuel followed her, and in the antechamber were visible the rough faces of seven or eight half-naked sailors. At the sight of these men the Englishman started and advanced a step, then restrained himself and retired into the farthest and most obscure corner of the apartment. Madame Morel sat down by her husband and took one of his hands in hers. Julie still lay with her head on his shoulder. Emmanuel stood in the center and seemed to form the link between Morel's family and the sailors at the door. "'How did this happen?' said Morel. "'Draw nearer, Penelon, said the young man, and tell us all about it.' An old seaman, bronzed by the tropical sun, advanced twirling the remains of a tarpaulin between his hands. "'Good day, Mr. Morel,' said he, as if he had just quitted Marseilles the previous evening and had just returned from A or Toulon. "'Good day, Penelon,' returned Morel, who could not refrain from smiling through his tears. "'Where is the captain?' "'The captain, Monsieur Morel, has stayed back sick at the Palma.' "'But please, God, it won't be much, and you will see him in a few days, all alive and hearty. "'Well, now tell your story, Penelon.' "'Penelon rolled his quid in his cheek, placed his hand before his mouth, "'turned his head, and set a long jet of tobacco-juice into the antechamber, "'advanced his foot, balanced himself, and began, "'You see, Monsieur Morel,' said he, we were somewhere between Cap Blanc and Cap Boyador, sailing with a fair breeze south-southwest after a week's calm, when Captain Gaumont comes up and says to me, I was at the helm, I should tell you, and says, Penelon, what do you think of these clouds coming up over here? I was just then looking at them myself. What do I say, Captain? Why, I think they are rising faster than they have any business to do and that they would not be so black if they didn't mean mischief. 
"'That's my opinion, too,' said the captain. "'I'll take precautions accordingly. "'We are carrying too much canvas. "'Of us, they are all hands. "'Take in the studding sills. "'Bestow the flying jib.' "'It was time. "'The squall was on us, "'and the vessel began to heel. "'Ah!' paid the captain. "'We have still too much canvas set. "'All hands, lower the mainsail!' Five minutes later it was down, and we sailed under mizzen topsails and tagallantsails. "'Well, Penelin,' said the captain, "'what makes you shake your head?' "'Why,' I says, "'I think you still have too much on.' "'I think you're right,' answered he. "'We shall have a gale. "'A gale? "'More than that. "'We shall have a tempest, or I don't know what's what.' You could see the wind coming like the dust at Montreton. Luckily the captain understood his business. Take in two reefs and the topsails, cried the captain. Let go the bullens. Haul the brace. Lower the tagallant sails. Haul out the reef tackles on the yards. That was not enough for those latitudes, said the Englishman. I should have taken four reefs and the topsails and furled the spanaker. His firm, sonorous, and unexpected voice made everyone start. Penelon put his hand over his eyes, then stared at the man who thus criticized the maneuvers of his captain. "'We did better than that, sir,' said the old sailor respectfully. "'We put up the helm to run before the tempest ten minutes after we struck our topsails and scudded under bare poles.' "'The vessel was very old to risk that,' said the Englishman. "'Eh, it was that that did the business.' After pitching heavily for twelve hours, we sprung a leak. Penelon, said the captain, I think we are sinking. Give me the helm and go down into the hold. I gave him the helm and descended. There was already three feet of water. All hands to the pumps! I shouted, but it was too late, and it seemed that the more we pumped, the more came in. Ah, said I, after four hours' work, since we are sinking, let us sink. We can die but once. "'That's the example you set, Penelon. cries the captain. "'Well, well, wait a minute.' He went into his cabin and came back with a brace of pistols. "'I'll blow the brains out of the first man who leaves the pump,' said he. "'Well done,' said the Englishman. "'There's nothing that gives you so much courage as good reasons,' continued the sailor. And during that time the wind had abated, the sea had gone down, but the water kept rising. Not much, only two inches an hour, but still it rose. Two inches an hour does not seem much, but in twelve hours that makes two feet, and three we had before, that makes five. Come, said the captain, we have all done all in our power, and Monsieur Morel will have nothing to reproach us with. We have tried to save the ship, let us now save ourselves. To the boats, my lads, as quick as you can. Now, continued Penelon. Now you see, Monsieur Morel, a sailor is attached to the ship, but still more to his life, so we did not wait to be told twice. The more so that the ship was sinking under us and seemed to say, Get along, save yourselves. We soon launched the boat, and all eight of us got into it. The captain descended last. Or, rather, he did not descend. He would not quit the vessel. So I took him round the waist, and I threw him into the boat, and then I jumped after him. It was time, for just as I jumped the deck burst with a noise like the broadside of a man-of-war. Ten minutes after, she pitched forward, then the other way, and spun round and round, and then good-bye to the Farron. As for us, we were three days without anything to eat or drink, so that we began to think of drawing lots who would feed the rest. And then we saw La Gironde, and made signals of distress. She perceived us, made for us, and took us all on board. There now, Monsieur Morel, that's the whole truth, on the honor of a sailor. Is it not true, you fellows there? A general murmur of approbation showed that the narrator had faithfully detailed their misfortunes and sufferings. Well, well, said Monsieur Morel, I know there was no one in fault but destiny. It was the will of God that this should happen, blessed be his name. What wages do to you? Oh, do not let us talk of that, Monsieur Morel. Yes, but we will talk of it. Well, then, three months, said Penelon. Cocles, page 
"'Pay two hundred francs to each of these good fellows,' said Morel. "'At another time,' added he, "'I should have said, give them besides two hundred francs over as a present, "'but times have changed, and the little money that remains to me is not my own.' "'Penelon turned to his companions and exchanged a few words with them. "'As for that, Monsieur Morel,' said he, again turning his quid, "'as for that—' "'As for what? The money. Well, well, we all say that fifty francs would be enough for us at present, and we will wait for the rest.' "'Oh, thanks, my friends, thanks,' cried Morel gratefully. "'Take it, take it, and if you can find another employer, enter his service, you are free to do so.' These last words produced a prodigious effect on the seaman. Penelon nearly swallowed his quid. Fortunately, he recovered. "'What, Monsieur Morel?' said he in a low voice. "'You send us away? You are then angry with us?' "'No, no,' said Monsieur Morel. "'I am not angry. Quite the contrary. And I do not send you away. But I have no more ships, and therefore I do not want any sailors.' "'No more ships,' returned Penelon. "'Well, then, you'll build some, and we'll wait for you.' "'I have no money to build ships with, Penelon,' said the poor owner mournfully. "'So I cannot accept your kind offer.' "'No more money? Well, then you must not pay us. We can scud like the Farron under bare poles.' "'Enough, enough,' cried Morel, almost overpowered. "'Leave me, I pray you, and—' We shall meet again in a happier time. Emmanuel, go with them and see that my orders are executed. At least, we shall see each other again, Monsieur Morel? asked Penelon. Yes, I hope so, at least. Now go. He made a sign to Cocles, who went first. The seamen followed him, and Emmanuel brought up the rear. Now, said the owner to his wife and daughter, leave me, for I wish to speak with this gentleman and he glanced toward the clerk of Thompson and French, who had remained motionless in the corner during the scene, in which he had taken no part except the few words we have mentioned. The two women looked at this person, whose presence had been entirely forgotten, and retired. But as she left the apartment, Julie gave the stranger a supplicating glance, to which she replied by a smile that an indifferent spectator would have been surprised to see on his stern features. The two men were left alone. "'Well, sir,' said Morel, sinking into a chair, "'you have heard all. I have nothing further to tell you.' "'I see,' returned the Englishman, "'that a fresh and unmerited misfortune has overwhelmed you, "'and this only increases my desire to serve you.' "'Oh, sir!' cried Morel. "'Let me see,' continued the stranger. "'I am one of your largest creditors.' "'Your bills, at least, are the first that will fall due. "'Do you wish for time to pay? "'A delay would save my honour, and consequently my life. "'How long a delay do you wish for?' Morel reflected. Two months,' said he. "'I will give you three, replied the stranger. "'But,' asked Morel, "'will the house of Thompson and French consent?' "'Oh, I take everything on myself. Today is the 5th of June.' "'Yes. Well, renew these bills up to the 5th of September. "'And on the 5th of September, at eleven o'clock, the hand of the clock pointed to eleven, "'I shall come to receive the money.' "'I shall expect you,' returned Morel. "'And I will pay you, or I shall be dead.' "'These last words were uttered in so low a tone that the stranger could not hear them. "'The bills were renewed.' The old ones destroyed, and the poor shipowner found himself with three months before him to collect his resources. The Englishman received his thanks with the phlegm particular to his nation, and Morel, overwhelming him with a grateful blessing, conducted him to the staircase. The stranger met Julie on the stairs. She pretended to be descending, but in reality was waiting for him. "'Oh, sir!' said she, clasping her hands. "'Mademoiselle?' said the stranger. One day 
you will receive a letter signed Sinbad the Sailor. Do exactly what the letter bids you, however strange it may appear. Yes, sir, returned Julie. Do you promise? I swear to you I will. It is well. Adieu, mademoiselle. Continue to be the good, sweet girl you are at the present, and I have great hopes that heaven will reward you by giving you Emmanuel for a husband. Julie uttered a faint cry, blushed like a rose, and leaned against the baluster. The stranger waved his hand, and continued to descend. In the court he found Penelon, who, with a rouleau of a hundred francs in either hand, seemed unable to make up his mind to retain them. "'Come with me, my friend,' said the Englishman. "'I wish to speak to you.'" So ends Chapter 29, The House of Morel and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Maria Tafidis. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 30. The 5th of September. The extension provided for by the agent of Thompson and French, at the moment when Morel expected it least, was to the poor ship owner so decided a stroke of good fortune that he almost dared to believe that fate was at length grown weary of wasting her spite upon him. The same day he told his wife, Emmanuel and his daughter, all that had occurred and a ray of hope, if not of tranquillity, returned to the family. Unfortunately, however, Morel had not only engagements with the house of Thompson and French, who had shown themselves so considerate towards him, and as he had said, in business he had correspondents and not friends. When he thought the matter over, he could by no means account for this generous conduct on the part of Thompson and French towards him, and could only attribute it to some such selfish arguments as this. We had better help a man who owes nearly three hundred thousand francs, and have those three hundred thousand francs at the end of three months, than hasten his ruin, and get only six or eight percent of our money back again. Unfortunately, whether through envy or stupidity, all Morel's correspondents did not take this view, and some even came to a contrary decision. The bills signed by Morel were presented at his office with scrupulous exactitude, and thanks to the delay granted by the Englishman, were paid by Cocle with equal punctuality. Cocle thus remained in his accustomed tranquillity. It was Morel alone who remembered with alarm that if he had to repay on the 15th the 50,000 francs of M. de Beauville, and on the 13th the 32,500 francs of bills, for which, as well as the debt due to the inspector of prisons, he had time granted, he must be a ruined man. The opinion of all the commercial men was that, under the reverses which had successively weighed down Morel, it was impossible for him to remain solvent. Great, therefore, was the astonishment when at the end of the month he cancelled all his obligations with his usual punctuality. Still confidence was not restored to all minds, and the general opinion was that a complete ruin of the unfortunate shipowner had been postponed only until the end of the month. The month passed, and Morel made extraordinary efforts to get in all his resources. Formerly his paper, at any date, was taken with confidence and was even in request. Morel now tried to negotiate bills at ninety days only, 
and none of the banks would give him credit. Fortunately, Morel had some funds coming in on which he could rely, and as they reached him, he found himself in a condition to meet his engagements when the end of July came. The agent of Thompson and French had not been again seen at Marseille. The day after, or two days after his visit to Morel, he had disappeared, and as in that city he had had no intercourse but with the mayor, the inspector of prisons, and Monsieur Morel, his departure left no trace except in the memories of these three persons. As to the sailors of the pharaon, they must have found snug berths elsewhere, for they also had disappeared. Captain Gomar, recovered from his illness, had returned from Palma. He delayed presenting himself at Morel's, but the owner, hearing of his arrival, went to see him. The worthy ship owner knew, from Penelon's recital, of the captain's brave conduct during the storm, and tried to console him. He brought him also the amount of his wages, which Captain Gomar had not dared to apply for. As he descended the staircase, Morel met Penelon, who was going up. Penelon had, it would seem, made good use of his money, for he was newly clad. When he saw his employer, the worthy tower seemed much embarrassed, drew on one side into the corner of the landing place, passed his quid from one cheek to the other, stared stupidly with his great eyes, and only acknowledged the squeeze of the hand which Morel as usual gave him by a slight pressure in return. Morel attributed Penelon's embarrassment to the elegance of his attire. It was evident the good fellow had not gone to such an expense on his own account. He was no doubt engaged on board some other vessel, and thus his bashfulness arose from the fact of his not having, if we may so express ourselves, worn mourning for the pharaoh longer. Perhaps he had come to tell Captain Gomar of his good luck, and to offer him employment from his new master. Worthy fellows, said Morel as he went away, may your new master love you as I loved you, and be more fortunate than I have been. August rolled by an unceasing effort on the part of Morel to renew his credit or revive the old. On the 20th of August, it was known at Marseille that he had left town in the mail coach, and then it was said that the bills would go to protest at the end of the month, and that Morel had gone away and left his chief clerk Emmanuel and his cashier cock to meet the creditors. But contrary to all expectation, when the 31st of August came, the house opened as usual, and cock appeared behind the grating on the counter, examined all bills presented with the usual scrutiny, and from first to last paid all with the usual precision. There came in, moreover, two drafts which M. Morel had fully anticipated, and which Cock paid as punctually as the bills which the ship owner had accepted. All this was incomprehensible, and then, with a tenacity peculiar to profits of bad news, the failure was put off until the end of September. On the first, Morel returned. He was awaited by his family with extreme anxiety for from this journey to Paris they hoped great things. Morel had thought of Danglars, who was now immensely rich, and had laid on the great obligations to Morel in former days, since to him it was owing that Danglars entered the service of the Spanish banker, with whom he had laid the foundations of his vast wealth. It was said at this moment that Danglars was worth from six to eight millions of francs, and had unlimited credit. Danglars, then, without taking a crown from his pocket, could save Morel. He had but to pass his word for a loan, and Morel was saved. Morel had long thought of Danglars, but had kept away from some instinctive motive, and had delayed as long as possible availing himself of this last resource. And Morel was right, for he returned home crushed by the humiliation of a refusal. Yet on his arrival Morel did not utter a complaint or say one harsh word. He embraced his weeping wife and daughter, pressed Emmanuel's hand with friendly warmth, and then going to his private room on the second floor, had sent for Coq. Then said the two women to Emmanuel, were indeed ruined. 
It was agreed in a brief council held among them that Julie should write to her brother, who was in garrison at Nîmes, to come to them as speedily as possible. The poor women felt instinctively that they required all their strength to support the blow that impended. Besides, Maximilien Morel, though hardly two and twenty, had great influence over his father. He was a strong-minded, upright young man. At the time when he decided on his profession, his father had no desire to choose for him, but had consulted young Maximilien's taste. He had at once declared for a military life, and had in consequence studied hard, passed brilliantly through the polytechnic school, and left it as sub-lieutenant of the 53rd of the line. For a year he had held his rank, and expected promotion on the first vacancy. In his regiment, Maximilien Morel was noted for his rigid observance, not only of the obligations imposed on a soldier, but also of the duties of a man, and he thus gained the name of the Stoic. We need hardly say that many of those who gave him this epithet repeated it because they had heard it and did not even know what it meant. This was the young man whom his mother and sister called to their aid to sustain them under the serious trial which they felt they would soon have to endure. They had not mistaken the gravity of this event, for the moment after Morel had entered his private office with Coq, Julie saw the latter leave it pale, trembling, and his features betraying the utmost consternation. She would have questioned him as he passed by her, but the worthy creature hastened down the staircase with unusual precipitation, and only raised his hands to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, mademoiselle, mademoiselle, what a dreadful misfortune! Who could ever have believed it? A moment afterwards, Julie saw him go upstairs carrying two or three heavy ledgers, a portfolio, and a bag of money. Morel examined the ledgers, opened the portfolio, and counted the money. All his funds amounted to six thousand or eight thousand francs, his bills receivable up to the fifth, to four thousand or five thousand, which, making the best of everything, gave him fourteen thousand francs to meet debts amounting to two hundred and eighty-seven thousand and five hundred francs. He had not even the means for making a possible settlement on account. However, when Morel went down to his dinner, he appeared very calm. This calmness was more alarming to the two women than the deepest dejection would have been. After dinner, Morel usually went out and used to take his coffee at the Faucillon Club and read the same four. This day, he did not leave the house, but returned to his office. As to Cock, he seemed completely bewildered. For part of the day, he went into the courtyard, seated himself on a stone with his head bare and exposed to the blazing sun. Emmanuel tried to comfort the women, but his eloquence faltered. The young man was too well acquainted with the business of the house not to feel that a great catastrophe hung over the Morel family. Night came. The two women had watched, hoping that when he left his room, Morel would come to them, but they heard him pass before their door and try to conceal the noise of his footsteps. They listened. He went to his sleeping room and fastened the door inside. Madame Morel sent her daughter to bed, and half an hour after Julie had retired, she rose, took off her shoes, and went stealthily along the passage to see through the keyhole what her husband was doing. In the passage she saw a retreating shadow. It was Julie, who, uneasy herself, had anticipated her mother. The young lady went with Madame Morel. His writing, she said. They had understood each other without speaking. Madame Morel looked again through the keyhole. Morel was writing, but Madame Morel remarked, what her daughter had not observed, that her husband was writing on stamped paper. The terrible idea that he was writing his will flashed across her. She shuddered, and yet had not strength to utter a word. Next day, Monsieur Morel seemed as calm as ever, went into his office as usual, came to his breakfast punctually, and then after dinner he placed his daughter beside him, took her head in his arms, and held her for a long time against his bosom. 
In the evening she told her mother that although it was apparently so calm, she had noticed that her father's heart beat violently. The next two days passed in much the same way. On the evening of the 4th of September, Monsieur Morel asked his daughter for the key of his study. Julie trembled at this request, which seemed to her of bad omen. Why did her father ask for this key, which she always kept, and which was only taken from her in childhood as a punishment? The young girl looked at Morel. What have I done wrong, father, she said, that you should take this key from me? Nothing, my dear, replied the unhappy man, the tears starting to his eyes at this simple question. Nothing. Only I want it. Julie made a pretense to feel for the key. I must have left it in my room, she said. And she went out, but instead of going to her apartment, she hastened to consult Emmanuel. Do not give this key to your father, said he, and tomorrow morning, if possible, do not quit him for a moment. She questioned Emmanuel, but he knew nothing or would not say what he knew. During the night, between the 4th and 5th of September, Madame Morel remained listening for every sound, and until three o'clock in the morning, she heard her husband pacing the room in great agitation. It was three o'clock when he threw himself on the bed. The mother and daughter passed the night together. They had expected Maximilien since the previous evening. At eight o'clock in the morning, Morel entered their chamber. He was calm, but the agitation of the night was legible in his pale and careworn visage. They did not dare to ask him how he had slept. Morel was kinder to his wife, more affectionate to his daughter, than he had ever been. He could not cease gazing at and kissing the sweet girl. Julie, mindful of Manuel's request, was following her father when he quitted the room, but he said to her quickly, Remain with your mother, dearest. Julie wished to accompany him. I wish you to do so, said he. This was the first time Morel had ever so spoken, but he said it in a tone of paternal kindness, and Julie did not dare to disobey. She remained at the same spot, standing mute and motionless. An instant afterwards, the door opened, she felt two arms encircle her, and a mouth pressed her forehead. She looked up and uttered an exclamation of joy. Maximilien, my dearest brother, she cried. At these words, Madame Morel rose, and threw herself into her son's arms. Mother, said the young man, looking alternately at Madame Morel and her daughter, what has occurred? What has happened? Your letter has frightened me, and I have come hither with all speed. Julie, said Madame Morel, making a sign to the young man, go and tell your father that Maximilien has just arrived. The young lady rushed out of the apartment. But on the first step of the staircase, she found a man holding a letter in his hand. Are you not Mademoiselle Julie Morel? inquired the man, with a strong Italian accent. Yes, sir, replied Julie with hesitation. What is your pleasure? I do not know you. Read this letter, he said, handing it to her. Julie hesitated. It concerns the best interest of your father, said the messenger. The young girl hastily took the letter from him. She opened it quickly and read. Go this moment to the Allée de Meillon. Enter the house number 15. Ask the porter for the key of the room on the fifth floor. Enter the apartment. Take from the corner of the mantelpiece purse netted in red silk and give it to your father. It is important that he should receive it before eleven o'clock. You promised to obey me implicitly. Remember your oath. Seen by the sailor. The young girl uttered a joyful cry raised her eyes, looked round to question the messenger, but he had disappeared. She cast her eyes again over the note to peruse it a second time, and so there was a postscript. She read, It is important that you should fulfill this mission in person and alone. If you go accompanied by any other person, or should anyone else go in your place, the porter will reply that does not know anything about it. This postscript decreased greatly the young girl's happiness. Was there nothing to fear? Was there not some snare laid for her? Her innocence had kept her in ignorance of the dangers that might assail a young girl of her age. But there is no need to know danger in order to fear it, 
Indeed, it may be observed that it is usually unknown perils that inspire the greatest terror. Julie hesitated and resolved to take counsel. Yet through a singular impulse, it was neither to her mother nor her brother that she applied, but to Emmanuel. She hastened down and told him what had occurred on the day when the agent of Thompson and French had come to her father's. He related the scene on the staircase, repeated the promise she had made, and showed him the letter. "'You must go, then, mademoiselle,' said Emmanuel. "'Go there?' murmured Julie. "'Yes, I will accompany you.' "'But did you not read that I must be alone?' said Julie. "'And you shall be alone,' replied the young man. "'I will await you at the corner of the Rue de Musée, "'and if you are so long absent as to make me uneasy, "'I will hasten to rejoin you, "'and woo to him of whom you shall have cause to complain to me.' "'Then, Emmanuel, said the young girl with hesitation, "'it is your opinion that I should obey this invitation?' "'Yes. "'Did not the messenger say your father's safety depended upon it?' But what danger threatens him, then, Emmanuel, she asked. Emmanuel hesitated a moment, but his desire to make Julie decide immediately made him reply. Listen, he said. Today is the 5th of September, is it not? Yes. Today, then, at 11 o'clock, your father has nearly 300,000 francs to pay. Yes, we know that. Well, then, continued Emmanuel, we have not fifteen thousand francs in the house. What will happen, then? Why, if today, before eleven o'clock, your father has not found someone who will come to his aid, who will be compelled at twelve o'clock to declare himself a bankrupt. Oh, come, then, come, cried she, hastening away with the young man. During this time, Madame Morel had told her son everything. The young man knew quite well that, after the succession of misfortunes which had befallen his father, great changes had taken place in the style of living and housekeeping. But he did not know that matters had reached such a point. He was thunderstruck. Then, rushing hastily out of the apartment, he ran upstairs, expecting to find his father in his study. But he rapped there in vain. While he was yet at the door of the study, he heard the bedroom door open, turn, and saw his father. Instead of going direct to his study, M. Morel had returned to his bedchamber, which was only this moment quitting. Morel uttered a cry of surprise at the sight of his son, of whose arrival he was ignorant. He remained motionless on the spot, pressing with his left hand something he had concealed under his coat. Maximilien sprang down the staircase and threw his arms round his father's neck but suddenly recalled and placed his right hand on Mohan's breast. Father, he exclaimed, turning pale as death, what are you going to do with that brace of pistols under your coat? Oh, this is what I feared, said Morel. Father, father, in heaven's name, exclaimed the young man, what are these weapons for? Maximilien, replied Morel, looking fixedly at his son, you are a man and a man of honor. Come and I will explain to you. And with a firm step, Morel went up to his study, while Maximilien followed him, trembling as he went. Morel opened the door and closed it behind his son, then crossing the ante-room, went to his desk on which he placed the pistols, and pointed with his finger to an open ledger. In this ledger was made out an exact balance sheet of his affairs. Morel had to pay within half an hour 297,000 five hundred francs. All he possessed was fifteen thousand two hundred and fifty seven francs. Read, said Morel. The young man was overwhelmed as he read. Morel said not a word. What could he say? What need he add to such a desperate proof and figures? And have you done all that is possible, father, to meet this disastrous result? asked the young man after a moment's pause. I have, replied Morel. You have no money coming in on which you can rely? None. You have exhausted every resource? All. And in half an hour, said Maximilien in a gloomy voice, our name is dishonored. Blood washes out dishonor, said Morel. You are right, father. I understand you. 
and extending his hand towards one of the pistols, he said, There is one for you, and one for me. Thanks. Morel caught his hand. Your mother! Your sister! Who will support them? A shadow ran through the young man's frame. Father, said, do you reflect that you are bidding me to live? Yes, I do so bid you, answered Morel. It is your duty. You have a calm, strong mind, Maximilien. Maximilien, you are no ordinary man. I make no request or command. I only ask you to examine my position as if it were your own, and then judge for yourself. The young man reflected for a moment. Then an expression of sublime resignation appeared in his eyes, and with a slow and sad gesture, he took off his two epaulets, the insignia of his rank. Be it so, then, my father, he said, extending his hand to Morel. Die in peace, my father, I will live. Morel was about to cast himself on his knees before his son, but Maximilien caught him in his arms, and those two noble hearts were pressed against each other for a moment. You know it is not my fault, said Morel. Maximilien smiled. I know, father, you are the most honorable man I have ever known. Good, my son, and now there is no more to be said. Go and rejoin your mother and sister. My father, said the young man, bending his knee. Bless me. Morel took the head of his son between his two hands, drew him forward, and kissing his forehead several times, he said, Oh, yes, yes, I bless you in my own name, and in the name of three generations of irreproachable men, who say through me, The edifice which misfortune has destroyed, providence may build up again. On seeing me die such a death, the most inexorable will have pity on you. To you, perhaps, they will accord the time they have refused to me. Then, do your best to keep our name free from dishonor. Go to work, labor, young man, struggle ardently and courageously. Live yourself, your mother and sister, with the most rigid economy, so that from day to day the property of those whom I leave in your hands may augment and fructify. Reflect how glorious a day it will be, how grand, how solemn that day of complete restoration, on which you will say in this very office, My father died because he could not do what I have this day done, but he died calmly and peaceably, because in dying he knew what I should do. My father, my father, cried the young man, why should you not live? If I live, all would be changed. If I live, interest would be converted into doubt, pity into hostility. If I live, I am only a man who has broken his word, failed in his engagements, in fact, only a bankrupt. If, on the contrary, I die, remember, Maximilien, my corpse is that of an honest but unfortunate man. Living, my best friends would avoid my house. Then, all Marseille will follow me in tears to my last home. Living, you would feel shame at my name. Dead, you may raise your head and say, I am the son of him you killed, because for the first time he has been compelled to break his word. The young man uttered a groan, but appeared resigned. And now, said Morel, leave me alone and endeavor to keep your mother and sister away. Will you not see my sister once more? asked Maximilien. Alas, by final hope was concealed by the young man in the effect of this interview, and therefore he had suggested it. Morel shook his head. I saw her this morning, and bade her adieu. Have you not particular commands to live with me, my father? inquired Maximilien in a faltering voice. Yes, my son, and a sacred command. Say it, my father. The house of Thompson and French is the only one who, from humanity, or it may be selfishness, it is not for me to read men's hearts, has had any pity for me. Its agent will in ten minutes present himself to receive the amount of the bill of 287,500 francs, I will not say granted, but offer me three months. Let this house be the first repaid, my son, and respect this man. Father, I will, said Maximilien. And now once more adieu, said Morel. Go, leave me. I would be alone. You will find my will in the secretary in my bedroom. The young man remained standing and motionless, having by the force of will another power of execution. Hear me, Maximilien, said his father. Suppose I was a soldier like you, and ordered to carry a certain redoubt and you knew I must be killed in the assault. Would you not say to me, as you said just now? Go, father, 
for you are dishonoured by delay, and death is preferable to shame. Yes, yes, said the young man, yes, and once again embracing his father with convulsive pressure, he said, be it so, my father, and he rushed out of the study. When his son had left him, Morel remained an instant standing with his eyes fixed on the door, and putting forth his arm, he pulled the bell. After a moment's interval, Coquel appeared. It was no longer the same man. The fearful revelations of the three last days had crushed him. The thought the house of Morel is about to stop payment would bend him to the earth more than twenty years would otherwise have done. My worthy cock, said Morel, in a tone impossible to describe, do you remain in the antechamber? When the gentleman who came three months ago, the agent of Thompson and French, arrives, announce his arrival to me. Cock made no reply, made a sign with his head, went into the ante room, and seated himself. Morel fell back in his chair, his eyes fixed on the clock. There were seven minutes left, that was all. The hand moved on with incredible rapidity. He seemed to see its motion. What passed in the mind of this man at the supreme moment of his agony cannot be told in words. He was still comparatively young, he was surrounded by the loving care of a devoted family, but he had convinced himself by a course of reasoning, illogical, perhaps, yet certainly plausible, that he must separate himself from all he held dear in the world, even life itself. To form the slightest idea of his feeling, one must have seen his face, with its expression of enforced resignation and its tear moistened eyes raised to heaven. The minute hand moved on, the pistols were loaded, he stretched forth his hand, took one up, and murmured his daughter's name. Then he laid it down, seized his pen, and wrote a few words. It seemed to him as if he had not taken a sufficient farewell of his beloved daughter. Then he turned again to the clock, counting time not, not by minutes by seconds. He took up the deadly weapon again, his lips parted and his eyes fixed on the clock, and then shuddered at the click of the trigger as he cocked the pistol. At this moment of mortal anguish, a cold sweat came forth upon his brow, a pain stronger than death clutched at his heart strength. He heard the door of the staircase creak on its hinges, the clock gave its warning strike eleven, the door of his study opened. Morel did not turn round, expecting these words of Cock, the agent of Thompson and French. He placed the muzzle of the pistol between his teeth. Suddenly he heard a cry. It was his daughter's voice. He turned and saw Julie. The pistol fell from his hand. My father! cried the young girl, out of breath and half dead with joy. Saved! You are saved! And she threw herself into his arms, holding in her extended hand a red, netted silk purse. Saved, my child! said Morel. What do you mean? We are saved. Saved! See! See! said the young girl. Morel took the purse and started as he did so, for a vague remembrance reminded him that it once belonged to himself. At one end was a receipted bill for the two hundred and eighty-seven thousand francs, and at the other was a diamond as large as a hazelnut, with these words on a small slip of parchment. Julie's Diary Morel passed his hand over his brow. It seemed to him a dream. At this moment, the clock struck eleven. He felt as if his stroke of the hammer fell upon his heart. Explain, my child, he said. Explain, my child. Where did you find this purse? In a house in the Alley de Meillon, number fifteen, on the corner of a mantelpiece, in a small room on the fifth floor. But, cried Morel, this purse is not yours. Julie handed to her father the letter she had received in the morning. And did you go alone? said Morel, after he had read it. Emmanuel accompanied me, father. He was to have waited for me at the corner of the Rue de Musée. But strange to say, he was not there when I returned. Monsieur Morel, exclaimed a voice on the stairs, Monsieur Morel. It is his voice, said Julie. At this moment Emmanuel entered, his countenance full of animation and joy. The pharaoh, he cried, the pharaoh. What? What the pharaoh? Are you mad, Emmanuel? You know the vessel is lost. The pharaoh, sir, they signal the pharaoh. The pharaoh is entering the harbour. Morel fell back in his chair. His strength was failing him. His understanding, weakened by such events, refused to comprehend such incredible, unheard of, fabulous facts. But his son came. Father, cried Maxime, how could you say the pharaoh was lost? The lookout has signaled her, and they say she is now coming into port. My dear friend, said Morel, if this be so, it must be a miracle of heaven. 
Impossible, impossible! But what was real and not less incredible was the purse he held in his hand, the acceptance received in it, a splendid diamond. Ah, sir, exclaimed Cock, what can it mean? The found Come, dear ones, said Morel, rising from his seat. Let us go and see, and heaven have pity upon us if it be false intelligence. They all went out, and on the stairs met Madame Morel, who had been afraid to go up into the study. In a moment they were at the Canabier. There was a crowd on the pier. All the crowd gave way before Morel. The farm, the farm, said every voice. And one fool to see, in front of the tower of Saint Jean, was a sheep bearing on a stern these words, printed in white letters. The farm, Morel and son of Marseille. She was the exact duplicate of the other farm, and loaded as they had been with cochineal and indigo. She cast anchor, clued up sails, and on the deck was Captain Gomar giving orders, and good old Penelon making signals to Monsieur Morel. To doubt any longer was impossible. There was the evidence of the senses, and ten thousand persons who came to corroborate the testimony. As Morel and his son embraced on the pier ahead, in the presence and amid the applause of the whole city witnessing this event, a man, with his face half covered by a black beard, and who, concealed behind the sentry box, watched the scene with delight, uttered these words in a low tone. Be happy, noble heart, be blessed for all the good thou hast done and will do hereafter, and let my gratitude remain in obscurity like your good deeds. And with a smile expressive of supreme content, left his hiding place, and without being observed, Descending one of the flights of steps provided for debarkation, and hailing through town, shouted, Jacopo, Jacopo, Jacopo! Then a launch came to shore, took him on board, and conveyed him to a yacht splendidly fitted up, on whose desk he sprang with the activity of a sailor. Thence he once again looked towards Morel, who, weeping with joy, was shaking hands most cordially with all the crowd round him, and thanking with a look the unknown benefactor whom he seemed to be seeking in the sky. And now, said the unknown, farewell, kindness, humanity and gratitude, farewell to all the feelings that expel the heart. I have been heaven's substitute to recompense the good. Now the god of vengeance yields to me his power to punish the wicked. By these words he gave a signal, and as if only awaiting this signal, the yacht instantly put out to sea. End of chapter 30「私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、私の名前は、and the Baron France Daphine were at Florence. They had agreed to see the carnival at Rome that year, and that France, for for the last three or four years had inhabited Italy, should act as a Cicerone to Albert. As it is no inconsiderable affair to spend a carnival at Rome, especially when you have no great desire to sleep on the Piazza del Popolo or the Campo Vassino, they wrote to Signor Pastrini, the proprietor of the Hotel de Landros, Piazza di Spagna, to reserve comfortable apartments for them. Signor Pastrini replied that he had only two rooms and a parlor on the third floor, which he offered at low charge of a Louis per diem. They accepted this offer, but wishing to make the best use of the time that was left, Albert started for Naples. As for France, he remained at Florence, and after having passed a few days in exploring the paradise of the Cassine and spending two or three evenings at the houses of the Florentine nobility, he took a fancy into his head, having already visited Corsica, the cradle of Bonaparte, to visit Alba, the waiting place of Napoleon. One evening he cast off the painter of a sailboat from the iron ring that secured it to the dock of Lehorn, wrapped himself in his coat and lay down, and said to the crew, to the island of Elba. The boat shot out of the harbor like a bird, and next morning France disembarked at the port of Ferraggio. He traversed the island, after having followed the traces with footsteps that the giant had left, and re-embarked for Marciana. Two hours after, he again landed at Pianosa, 
where he was assured that red partridges abounded. The sport was bad. Franz only succeeded in killing a few partridges and, like every unsuccessful sportsman, he returned to the boat very much out of temper. Ah, if your excellence choose, said the captain, you might have capital sport. Where? Do you see that island? continued the captain, pointed to a conical pile rising from the indigo sea. Well, what is this island? Th the island of Monte Cristo. But I have no permission to shoot over this island. Your Excellency does not require a permit, for the island is uninhabited. Ah, indeed, said the young man. A desert island in the midst of the Mediterranean must be a curiosity. It is very natural. This island is a mass of rocks, and does not contain an acre of land capable of cultivation. To whom does this island belong? To Tuscany. What game shall I find there? Thousands of wild goats. Who live upon stones, I suppose, said Franz with an incredulous smile. No, but by browsing the shrubs and trees that grow up to the crevices of the rocks. Where can I sleep? On shores in the grottoes, or on board in our cloak. Besides, if your excellency pleases, we can live as soon as you like. We can sail as well by night and by day, and if the wind drops we can use our oars. As Franz had sufficient time, and his apartment at Rome were not yet available, he accepted the proposition. Upon his answer in the affirmative, the sailors exchanged a few words together in a lower tone. Well, asked he, what now? Is there any difficulty in the way? No, replied the captain, but we must warn your excellency that the island is an infected port. What do you mean? Monte Cristo, although uninhabited, yet serves occasionally as a refuge for the smugglers and pirates who come from Corsica, Sardinia and Africa, and if it becomes known that we have been there, we shall have to perform quarantine for six days on our return to Leghorn. The deuce! That puts a different face on the matter. Six days? Why, that's as long as the Almighty took to make the world. Too long a wait, too long. But who will say your Excellency has been on Monte Cristo? Oh, I shall not, cried France. Nor I, nor I, chose the sailors. Then steer for Monte Cristo. The captain gave his orders, the helm was put up, and the boat was soon sailing in the direction of the island. France waited until all was in order, and, when the sail was filled and four sailors had taken their place, three forward and one at the helm, he resumed the conversation. Gaetano, said he to the captain, you tell me Monte Cristo serves as a refuge for pirates who are, it seems to me, a very different kind of game from the goats. Yes, Your Excellency, and it is true. I know there were smugglers, but I thought that since the capture of Algiers and the destruction of the Regency, pirates existed only in the romances of Cooper and Captain Marriott. Your Excellency is mistaken. There are pirates, like the bandits who were believed to have been exterminated by Pope Leo XII, and who yet, every day, robbed travelers at the gates of Rome. Has not Your Excellency heard that the French charge of affairs was robbed six months ago within five hundred paces of the Lettry? Oh yes, I heard that. Well then, if like us, your excellency lived the Leghorn, you would hear, from time to time, that a little merchant vessel, or an English yacht that was expected at Bastia, at Porto Ferraccio, or at Civita Vecchia, has not arrived. No one knows what has become of it, but, doubtless, it has struck on a rock and foundered. Now, this rock it has made has been a long and narrow boat, manned by six or eight men, who have surprised and plundered it some dark and stormy night, near some desert and gloomy island, as when did plunder a carriage in the recesses of a forest. But, asked France, who lay wrapped in his cloak at the bottom of the boat, why do not those who have been plundered complain to the French, Sardinian or Tuscan governments? Why? said Gaetano with a smile. Yes, why? Because, in first place, they transfer from the vessel to their own boat whatever they think was taken. Then they bind the crew hand and foot, 
they attach to everyone's neck a four and twenty pound ball, a large hole is chopped in the vessel's bottom, and then they leave her. At the end of ten minutes, the vessel begins to roll heavily and settle down. First one gun go under, then the other. Then they lift and sink again, and both go under at once. All at once there is a noise like a cannon. That's the air blowing up the deck. Soon, the water rushes out of the scupper holes like a whale spouting. The vessel gives a last groan, spins round and round and disappears, forming a vast whirlpool in the ocean, and then all is over, so that in five minutes, nothing but the eye of God can see the vessel where she lies at the bottom of the sea. Do you understand now? said the captain. Why no complaints are made to the government, and why the vessel never reaches port? It is probable that if Caetano had related this previous to proposing the expedition, France would have hesitated, but now that they had started, he thought it would be cowardly to draw back. He was one of those men who do not rashly court danger, but if danger presents itself, combat it with the most unutterable coolness. Calm and resolute, he treated any peril as he would an adversary in a duel, calculated its probable method of, of approach, retreated at all as a point of strategy and not from cowardice, was quick to see an opening for attack, and won victory at a single thrust. But, said he, I have travelled through Sicily and Calabria, I have sailed a month in the archipelago, and yet I never saw even the shadow of a bandit or a pirate. I did not tell you, your excellency this to deter you from your project, replied Gaetano, but you questioned me and I have answered, that's all. Yes, and your conversation is most interesting, and as I wish to enjoy it as long as possible, steer for Monte Cristo. The wind blew strongly, the boat made six or seven knots an hour, and they were rapidly reaching the end of their voyage. As they drew near, the island seemed to lift from the sea, and the air was so clear that they could already distinguish the rocks heap on one another, like cannonballs in an arsenal, with green bushes and trees growing in the crevices. As for the sailors, although they appeared perfectly tranquil, yet it was evident that they were on the alert, and that they carefully watched the glassy surface over which they were sailing, and on which a few fishing boats, with their white sails, were alone visible. They were within fifteen miles of Monte Cristo when the sun began to set behind Corsica, whose mountains appeared against the sky, showing their rough peaks in bold relief. This mass of rock, like the giant at the master, rose dead ahead, a formidable barrier, and intercepting the light that gilded at its massive peaks so that the voyagers were in shadow. Little by little, the shadow rose higher and seemed to drive before it the last rays of the expiring day. At last, the reflection rested on the summit of the mountain, where it paused an instant, like the fiery crest of a volcano, and then gloom gradually covered the summit, as it had covered the base, and the island now only appeared to be a grey mountain that grew continually darker. Half an hour after, the night was quite dark. Fortunately, the mariners were used to these latitudes, and knew every rock in the Tuscan archipelago, for in the midst of this obscurity France was not without uneasiness. Corsica had long since disappeared, and Monte Cristo itself was invisible, but sailors seemed, like the lynx, to see in the dark, and the pilot to steer did not evince the slightest hesitation. An hour passed since the sun had set. When France fancied he saw, at a quarter of a mile to the left, a dark mass, but he could not precisely make out what it was, and fearing to excite the mere sun sailors by mistaking a floating cloud for land, he remained silent. Suddenly a great light appeared on the strand. Land might resemble a cloud, but fire was not a meteor. What is this light? asked he. Hush, said the captain, it is a fire. But you told me the island was uninhabited. I said there were no fixed habitations on it, but I said also that it served sometimes as a harbor for smugglers. And for pirates? And for pirates, returned Gaetano, repeating Francis' words. 
It is for that reason I have given orders to pass the island, for, as you see, the fire is behind us. But this fire? continued Franz. It seems to me rather reassuring than otherwise. Men who did not wish to be seen would not light a fire. Oh, that goes for nothing, said Gaetano. If you can guess the position of the island in the darkness, you will see that the fire cannot be seen from the sides or from Pianosa, but only from the sea. You think, then, this fire indicates the presence of unpleasant neighbors? That is what we must find out, returned Gaetano, fixing his eyes on the terrestrial star. How can you find out? You shall see. Gaetano consulted with his companions, and after five minutes' discussion, a maneuver was executed which caused the vessel to take out. They returned the way they had come, and in a few minutes the fire disappeared, hidden by an elevation of the land. The pilot again changed the course of the boat, which rapidly approached the island, and was soon within fifteen paces of it. Gaetano lowered the sails, and the boat came to rest. All this was done in silence, and from the moment that their course was changed, not a word was spoken. Gaetano, who had proposed the expedition, had taken all the responsibility on himself. The four sailors fixed their eyes on him while they go out their oars and held themselves in readiness to row away, which, thanks to the darkness, would not be difficult. As for Franz, he examined his arms with the utmost coolness. He had two double barrel guns and a rifle. He loaded them, looked at the priming, and waited quietly. During this time, the captain had thrown off his vest and shirt, and secured his trousers round his waist. His feet were naked, so he had no shoes and stockings to take off. After these preparations, he placed his finger on his lips, and lowering himself noiselessly into the sea, swam towards the shore with such precaution that it was impossible to hear the slightest sound. He could only be traced by the phosphorescent line in his way. This track soon disappeared. It was evident that he had touched the shore. Everyone on board remained motionless for half an hour, when the same luminous track was again observed, and the swimmer was soon on board. Well, exclaimed Franz and sailors in unison. They are Spanish smugglers said he. They have with them two Corsican bandits. And what are these Corsican bandits doing here with Spanish smugglers? Alas, returned the captain with an accent of the most profound pity. We are always to help one another. Very often the bandits are hard pressed by gendarmes or carabiners. Well, they see a vessel and good fellows like us on board, they come and demand hospitality of us. You can't refuse help to a poor hunted devil. We receive them, and for a greater security we stand out to sea. This costs us nothing and saves the life, or at least the liberty, of a fellow creature who on the first occasion returns service by pointing out some safe spot where we can land our goods without interruption. Ah, said Franz, then you are a smuggler occasionally, Gaetano. Your Excellency, we must live somehow, returned the other, smiling impenetrably. Then you know the men who are now on Monte Cristo? Oh yes, we sailors are like Freemasons and recognize each other by signs. And do you think we have nothing to fear if we land? Nothing at all. Smugglers are not thieves. But these two Corsican bandits, said Franz, calculating the chances of peril. It is not their fault that they are bandits, but that of the authorities. How so? Because they are pursued for having made the stiff, as if it was not in a Corsican's nature to revenge himself. What do you mean by having made the stiff? Having assassinated a man? said Franz, continuing his investigation. I mean that they have killed an enemy, which is a very different thing, returned the captain. Well said the young man. Let us demand hospitality of these smugglers and bandits. Do you think they will grant it? Without doubt. How many are they? Four, and the bandits make six. Just our number, so if they prove troublesome, 
we shall be able to hold them in check. So, for the last time, steer to Monte Cristo. Yes, but your excellency will permit us to take all due precautions. By all means, be as wise as Nestor and as prudent as Ulysses. I will more than permit, I exhort you. Silence, then, said Gaetano. Everyone obeyed. For a man who, like friends, viewed his position in its true light, it was a grave one. He was alone in the darkness with sailors whom he did not know, and who had no reason to be devoted to him, who knew that he had several thousand francs in his belt, and who had often examined these weapons, which were very beautiful, if not with envy, at least with curiosity. On the other hand, he was about to land, without any other escort than these men, on an island which had, indeed, a very religious name but which did not seem to France likely to afford him much hospitality, thanks to the smugglers and bandits. The history of the scuttled vessels, which had appeared improbable during the day, seemed very probable at night. Placed as he was between two possible sources of danger, he kept his eyes on the crew and his gun in his hand. The sailors had again hoisted sail, and the vessel was once more cleaving the waves. Through the darkness, France, whose eyes were now more accustomed to it, could see the looming shore along which the boat was sailing, and then, as they rounded the rocky point, he saw the fire more brilliant than ever, and about it five or six persons seated. The blades illuminated the sea for a hundred paces around. Gaetano skirted the light, carefully keeping the boat in shadow. Then, when they were opposite the fire, he steered to the center of the circle, singing a fishing song, of which his companions sang the chorus. At first words, the song the men seated round the fire arose and approached the landing place, their eyes fixed on the boat, evidently seeking to know who the newcomers were and what were their intentions. They soon appeared satisfied and returned, with the exception of one who remained at shore, to their fire, and which the carcass of a goat was roasting. When the boat was within twenty paces of the shore, the men on the beach, who carried the carbine, presented arms after the manner of a sentinel and cried, Who comes there? in Sardinian. Friends coolly cocked those perils. Caetano then exchanged a few words with this man, which the traveller did not understand, but which evidently concerned him. Will your excellency give your name or remain incognito? asked the captain. My name must remain unknown. Merely say I am a Frenchman traveling for pleasure. As soon as Gaetano had transmitted this answer, the sentinel gave an order to one of the men seated round the fire, who rose and disappeared among the rocks. Not a word was spoken, everyone seemed occupied. France with his disembarkment, the sailors with their sails, the smugglers with their goats. But in the midst of all this careness, it was evident that they mutually observed each other. The man who had disappeared returned suddenly on the opposite side to that by which he had left. He made a sign with his head to the sentinel who, turning to the boat, said, Sacomodi. The Italian Sacomodi is untranslatable. It means at once, come, enter, you are welcome, make yourself at home, you are the master. It is like that Turkish phrase of Moliere that so astonished you for wise gentlemen, but a number of things implied in its utterance. And the sailors did not wait for a second invitation, for a stroke of the war brought them to land. Gaetano sprang to shore, exchanged a few words with the sentinel, then his comrades disembarked, and glass he came friends. One of his guns was sung over his shoulder, Gaetano had the other, and the sailor held his rifle. His dress, half artist, half dandy, did not excite any suspicion and, consequently, no risky attitude. The boat was moored to the shore, and they advanced a few paces to find a comfortable bivouac. But doubtless, the spot they chose did not suit smugglers who filled the post of sentinel, for he cried out, Not that way, if you please. Gaetano faltered an excuse and advanced to the opposite side while two sailors kindled the torches at fire to light them on their way. They advanced about thirty paces, and then stopped at a small explanade surrounded with rocks, in which seats had been cut, 
not unlike same tree boxes. Around in the crevices of the rocks grew a few dwarf oaks and thick bushes of myrtles. Franz lowered the torch and saw by the mass of cinders that had accumulated that he was not the first to discover this retreat, which was, doubtless, one of the halting places of the wandering visitors of Monte Cristo. As for his suspicions, once on terra firma, once that he had seen the indifferent, if not friendly, appearance of his host, his anxiety had quite disappeared, or rather, at the sight of the gold, had turned to appetite. He mentioned this to Gaetano, who replied that nothing could be more easy than to prepare a supper when having their boat bread, wine, half a dozen partridges, and a good fire to roast them by. Besides, added he, if the smell of their roast meat tempts you, I will go and offer them two of our boars for a slice. You are a born diplomat, returned Franz. Go and try. Meanwhile, the sailors had collected dried sticks and branches with which they made a fire. Franz waited impatiently, inhaling the aroma of the roasted meat, when the captain returned with a mysterious air. Well, said Franz, anything new? Do they refuse? On the contrary, returned Gaetano, the chief, who was told you are a young Frenchman, invites you to sup with him. Well, observed Franz, this chief is very polite, and I see no objection, the more so as I bring my share of supper. Oh, it is not dead, he has plenty and to spare for supper but he makes one condition, and rather a peculiar one, before he will receive you at his house. His house? Has he built one here, then? No, but he has a very comfortable and all the same, so they say. You know this chief, then? I have heard talk of him. Favorably or otherwise? Both. The dears, and what is this condition? that you are blindfolded and do not take off the benches until he himself bids you. Franz looked at Gaetano to see, if possible, what he thought of his proposal. Ah, replied he, guessing Franz's thought, I know this is a serious matter. What should you do in my place? I, who have nothing to lose, I should go. You would accept? Yes, were it only out of curiosity. There is something very peculiar about this chief, then. Listen, said Gaetano, lowering his voice. I do not know if what they say is true. He stopped to see if anyone was near. What do they say? That this chief inhabits a cavern to which the pity palace is nothing. What nonsense, said Fres, reseating himself. It is not nonsense, it is quite true. Kama, the pilot of the Saint Ferdinand, went in once, and he came back amazed, vowing that such treasures were only to be heard of in fairy tales. Do you know, observed Franz, that with such stories you make me think of Ali Baba's enchanted cavern? I tell you what I have been told. Then you advise me to accept. Oh, I don't say that. Your Excellency will do as you please. I should be sorry to advise you in the matter. Franz pondered the matter for a few moments, concluded that the man so rich could not have any intention of plundering him of what little he had, and seeing only the prospect of a good supper, accepted. Gaetano departed with the reply. Franz was prudent and wished to learn all the possibly could concerning his host. He turned towards the sailor, who, during this dialogue, had sat gravely plucking the patridish with the air of a man proud of his office, and asked him how this man had landed, as no vessel of any kind was visible. Never mind that, returned the sailor. I know their vessel. Is it a very beautiful vessel? I would not wish for a bearer to sail round the world. Of what burden is she? About a hundred tons, but she is built to stand any weather. She is what English call a yacht. Where was she built? I know not, but my own opinion is she is a Genoese. And how did the leader of smugglers, continued Franz, 
ventured to build a vessel designed for such a purpose at Genoa. I did not say that the owner was a smuggler, replied the sailor. No, but Gaetano did, I thought. Gaetano had only seen the vessel from a distance, he had not then spoken to anyone. And if this person be not a smuggler, who is he? A wealthy signor, who travels for his pleasure. Come, thought Fred. He is still more mysterious, since the two accounts do not agree. What is his name? If you ask him, he says Simbad the Sailor, but I doubt if it be his real name. Simbad the Sailor? Yes. And where does he reside? On sea. What country does he come from? I do not know. Have you ever seen him? Sometimes. What sort of man is he? Your Excellency will judge for yourself. Where will he receive me? No doubt in the subterranean place Guy Channel told you of. Have you ever had a curiosity, when we have landed and found this island deserted, to seek for this enchanted palace? Oh yes, more than once, but always in vain. We examined the grotto all over, but we never could find the slightest trace of any opening. They say that the door is not opened by a key, but a magic word. Decidedly, muttered Fred, this is an Arabian night's adventure. His Excellency waits for you, said a voice, which he recognizes that of the sentinel. He was accompanied by two of the edge's crew. Franz drew his handkerchief from his pocket and presented it to the man who had spoken to him. Without uttering a word, they bandaged his eyes with a care that showed their apprehension of his committing some indiscretion. Afterwards, he was made to promise that he would not make the least attempt to raise the bandage. He promised. Then his two guides took his arms, and he went on, guided by them, and preceded by the sentinel. After going about thirty paces, he smelled the appetizing odor of the key that was roasting, and knew thus he was passing the bivouac. They then led him on about fifty paces further, evidently advancing towards that part of the shore where they would not allow Gaetano to go, a refusal he could now comprehend. Presently, by a change in the atmosphere, he knew that they were entering a cave. After going on for a few seconds more, he heard a crackling, and it seemed to him as though the atmosphere again changed and became balmy and perfumed. At length his feet touched on a thick and soft carpet, and his guides let go their hold of him. There was a moment's silence, and then a voice, in excellent French, although with a foreign accent, said, Welcome, sir. I beg you will remove your bandage. It may be supposed then, Franz did not wait for a repetition of this permission, but took off the handkerchief and found himself in the presence of a man from thirty-eight to forty years of age, dressed in a Tunisian costume, that is to say, a red cap with a long blue silk tassel, a vest of black cloth embroidered with gold, pantalons of deep red, large and full gaiters of the same color, embroidered with gold-like vest and yellow slippers. He had a splendid cashmere round his waist, and a small, sharp and crooked kangir was passed through his girdle. Although of a paleness that was almost livid, this man had a remarkably handsome face. His eyes were penetrating and sparkling. His nose, quite straight and projecting direct from the brow, was of a pure Greek type, while his teeth, as white as pearls, were set off admiration by the black moustache that encircled them. His pale ear was so peculiar that it seemed to pertain to one who had been long in tomb and who was incapable of resuming the healthy glow and hue of life. He was not particularly tall, but extremely well made, and, like the men of the south, had small hands and feet. But what astonished friends, who had treated Gaetano's description as a fable, was the splendor of the apartment in which he found himself. The entire chamber was lined with crimson brocade works with flowers of gold. In the recess was a kind of divan, surmounted with a stand of Arabian swords in silver scabbards, and handles resplendent with gems. 
From the ceiling hung a lamp of Venetian glass, a beautiful shape and color, while the feet rested on a turkey carpet in which they sunk to the instep. Tapestry hung before the door by which friends have entered, and also in front of another door leading into a second apartment which seemed to be brilliantly illuminated. The host gave friends time to recover from his surprise, and, moreover, returned look for look, not even taking his eyes off him. Sir, he said, after a pause, a thousand excuses for the precaution taken in your introduction hither, but as, during the great portion of the year, this island is deserted, if the secret of this abode were discovered, I should not less find on my return my temporary retirement in a state of great disorder, which would be exceedingly annoying, not for the loss it occasioned me, but because I should not have the certainty I now possess of separating myself from all the rest of mankind at pleasure. Let me now endeavor to make you forget this temporary unpleasantness and offer you what, no doubt, you did not expect to find here, that is to say, a tolerable supper and pretty comfortable beds. Ma foi, my dear sir, replied France, make no apologies. I have always observed that they vented people's eyes who penetrate enchanted palaces, for instance, those of Raoul in the Huguenots, and really I have nothing to complain of, for what I see makes me think of the wonders of the Arabian Nights. Alas, I may say with Lucullus, if I could have anticipated the honor of your visit, I would have prepared for it. But such as my hermitage, it is at your disposal. Such as is my supper, it is yours to share, if you will. Ali, it's supper ready. At this moment, the tapestry moved aside, and a Nubian, black as ebony, and dressed in a plain white tunic, made a sign to his master that all was prepared in the dining room. Now, said the unknown to friends, I do not know if you are of my opinion, but I think nothing is more annoying than to remain two or three hours together without knowing by name or appellation how to address one another. Pray observe that I too must respect the laws of hospitality to ask your name or title. I only request you to give me one by which I may have the pleasure of addressing you. As for myself, that I may put at your ease, I tell you that I am generally called Simbad sailor. And I, replied Franz, will tell you, as I only require his wonderful lamp to make me precisely like Aladdin, that I see no reason why at this moment I should not be called Aladdin. That will keep us from going away from the east, whither I am tempted to think I have been conveyed by some good genius. Well then, Signor Aladdin, replied the singular amphitryon. You heard our repast announced. Will you not take the trouble to enter the dining room, your humble servant going first to show you the way? At these words, moving aside the tapestry, Simbad preceded his guest. Friends now looked upon another scene of enchantment. The tables were splendid covered, and once convinced of this important point, he cast his eyes around him. The dining room was scarcely less striking than the room he had just left. It was entirely of marble, with antique bas reliefs of priceless value. And at four corners of this apartment, which was of long, were four magnificent statues, having baskets in their hands. These baskets contained four pyramids of most splendid fruit. There were Sicily pineapples, pomegranates from Malaga, origins from the Balearic Islands, peaches from France, and dates from Tunis. The supper consisted of a roast pheasant garnish with Corsican blackbirds, a worm's ham with jelly, a quarter of a kid with tartar sauce, a glorious torbot and a gigantic lobster. Between these large dishes were smaller ones containing various dainties. The dishes were of silver and the plates of Japanese china. Friends rubbed his eyes in order to assure himself that this was not a dream. Ali alone was present to wait at table, and acquitted himself so admirably that the guest complimented his host thereupon. Yes, replied he, while he did the honors of the supper with much ease and grace. 
Yes, he is a poor devil who is much devoted to me, and does all he can to prove it. He remembers that I have saved his life, and as he has regard for his head, he feels some gratitude towards me for having kept it on his shoulders. Ellie approached his master, took his hand, and kissed it. Would it be impertinent, Signor Simbad, said Franz, to ask you the particulars of this kindness? Oh, they are simple enough, replied the host. It seems the fellow had been caught wandering nearer to the harem of the Bay of Tunis than it he had promised to one of his scholars, and he was condemned by the Bay to have his tongue cut out and his hands and a head cut off. The tongue the first day, the hand second, and the head the third. I always had a desire to have a mute in my service, so learning the day his tongue was cut out, I went to the bay and proposed to give him for Ali a splendid double barreled gun, which I knew he was very desirous of having. He hesitated a moment, he was so very desirous to complete the poor devil's punishment. But when I added to the gun an English cutlass, with which I had shivered with Highness Yatag and to pieces, the bay yelled it and agreed to forgive the hand that had, but on condition that the poor fellow never again set foot on Tunis. This was a useless clause in the bargain, for whenever the coward sees the first glimpse of the shores of Africa, he runs down below, and can only be induced to appear again, when we are out of sight of that quarter of the globe. Friends remained a moment silent and pensive, hardly knowing what to think of the half-kindless, half-cruelty, with which his host related the brief narrative. And like the celebrated sailor whose name you have assumed, he said, by way of changing the conversation, you pass your life in traveling? Yes, I made the vow at the time when I little thought I should be able to accomplish it, said the unknown with a singular smile, and I made some others also which I hope I may fulfill in due season. Although Simbad pronounced these words with much calmness, his eyes gave forth gleams of extraordinary ferocity. You have suffered a great deal, sir, said Franz inquiringly. Simbad started and looked fixed at him as he replied. What makes you suppose so? Everything, answered Franz. Your voice, your look, your pallid complexion, and even the life you live. I? I live the happiest life possible, the real life of a Pasha. I am king of all creation. I am pleased with one place and stay there. I get tired of it, I leave it. I am free as a bird and I have wings like one. My attendants obey my slightest wish. Sometimes I amuse myself by delivering some bandit or criminal from the bonds of the law. Then I have my mode of dispensing justice, silent and sure, without respite or appeal, which condemns or pardons, and which no one sees. Ha! Huh. If you had tasted my life, you would not desire any other, and would never return to the world unless you had some great project to accomplish there. Revenge, for instance? Observed Franz. The unknown fixed on the young man one of those looks which penetrate into the depths of heart and thoughts. And why revenge? he asked. Because, replied Franz, you seem to me like a man who, persecuted by society, has a fearful account to settle with it. Ha! Ah, responded Simbad, laughing with his singular laugh which displayed his white and sharp teeth. You have not guessed rightly. Such as you see me, I am a sort of philosopher and one day, perhaps, I shall go to Paris to rival Monsieur Appert and little man in the blue cloak. And will that be the first time you ever took that journey? Yes, it will. I must seem to you by no means curious, but I assure you that it is not my fault I have delayed it so long. It will happen one day or the other. And do you propose to make this journey very shortly? I do not know. It depends on circumstances which depend on certain arrangements. I should like to be there at the time you come, and I will endeavor to repay you, as far as lies in my power, for your liberal hospitality displayed to me in Monte Cristo. I should avail myself of your offer with pleasure, replied the host, 
but unfortunately, if I go there, it will be, in all probability, incognito. The supper appeared to have been supplied solely for friends, for the unknown scarcely touched one or two dishes of the splendid banquet, to which his guest did ample justice. Then Ellie brought on dessert, or rather took the baskets from the hands of the statues and placed them on the table. Between the two baskets he placed a small silver cup with a silver cover. The care with which Tali placed his cup on the table roused Fran's curiosity. He raised the cover and saw a kind of greenish past, something like preserved angelica, but which was perfectly unknown to him. He replaced the lid, as ignorant of what the cup contained as if he was before he had looked at it, and then casting his eyes towards his host, he saw him smile at his disappointment. You cannot guess, said he, what there is in that small vase, can you? No, I really cannot. Well then, that green preserve is nothing less than the ambrosia which Eve served at the table of Jupiter. But, replied Fred, this ambrosia, no doubt, is passing through mortal hands that has lost its heavenly appellation and assumed the human name. In vulgar phrase, what may you term this composition for which, to tell the truth, I do not feel any particular desire? Ah, thus it is that our material origin is revealed, cried Sinbad. We frequently pass so near to happiness without seeing, without regarding it, or if we do see and regard it, yet without recognizing it. Are you a man of substantials, and this gold your god? Taste this and the minds of Peru, Guzerat, and Golconda are open to you. Are you a man of imagination, a poet? Taste this, and the boundaries of possibility disappear, the fields of infinite place open to you, you advance free in heart, free in mind, into the boundless realms of unfettered reverie. Are you ambitious, and do you seek after the greatness of the earth? Taste this, and in an hour you will be a king, not the king of a petty kingdom hidden in some corner of Europe like France, Spain or England, but king of the world, king of the universe, king of creation. Without bowing at the feet of Satan, we will be king and master of all the kingdom of the earth. Is it not tempting that I offer you, and is it not an easy thing, since it is only to do thus? Look, at this word, he uncovered a small cup which contained substance so loud that took a teaspoon of the magic sweet, sweet meat, raised it to his lips, and swallowed it slowly, with his eyes half shut and his head bent backwards. Franz did not disturb him whilst he observed his favorite sweet meat, but when he had finished he inquired, What then is this precious stuff? Did you ever hear, he replied, of the old man of the mountain who attempted to assassinate Philip Angostus? Of course I have. Well, you know he reigned over a rich valley, which was overhung by the mountain whence he derived this picturesque name. In this valley were magnificent gardens planted by Hassan ben Sabbath, and in these gardens isolated pavilions. Into these pavilions he admitted select, and there, says Marco Polo, gave them to eat a certain herb, which transported them to paradise in the midst of ever-blooming shrubs, ever-ripe fruit, and ever-lovely virgins. What these happy persons took for reality was but a dream, but it was a dream so soft, so voluptuous, so enthralling, that they sold themselves body and soul to him to give it to them, and obedient to his orders as to those of the deity, struck down the designated victim, died in torture without a murmur, believing that the death they underwent was but a quick transition to that life of delights, of which the only herb, now before you, had given them a slight foretaste. Then, cried Fraz, it is a shish. I know that, by name at least. That is it precisely, Signor Aladdin. It is a shish, the purest and most unadulterated ashes of Alexandria. The ashes of Abu Gore celebrated maker, the only man, the man to whom there should be built a palace, 
inscribed with these words, a grateful world to the dealer in happiness. Do you know, said Franz, I have a very great inclination to judge for myself of the truth or exaggeration of your eulogies. Just for yourself, Signor Levin, judge, but do not confine yourself to one trial. Like everyone else, we must habituate the senses to a fresh impression, gentle or violent, sad or joyous. There is a struggle in nature against this divine substance in nature which is not made for joy and clings to pain. Nature subdued most yells in the combat. The dream must succeed to reality, and then the dream reigns supreme. Then the dream becomes life, the life becomes the dream. But what changes occur? It is only by comparing the pains of actual being with the joys of the assumed existence that you would desire to live no longer, but the dream does forever. When you return to this mundane sphere from your visionary world, you would seem to live in a Napoleon spring for a Lapland winter, to quit paradise for earth, heaven for hell. Taste the ashes, guest of mine, taste the ashes. Friend's only reply was to take a teaspoonful of the marvelous preparation, about as much in quantity as his host had eaten, and lift it to his mouth. Diable, he said after having swallowed the divine preserve. I do not know if the results will be as agreeable as you describe, but the thing does not appear to me as palatable as you say. Because your palate has not yet been attuned to the sublimity of the substances it flavors. Tell me, the first time you tasted oyster, tea, porter, truffles, and sundry other dainties which you now adore, did you like them? Could you comprehend how the Romans stuffed their pheasants with asafoetida, and the Chinese eat swallows' nests? Hey, no. Well, it is the same with hashish. Only eat for a week, and nothing in the world will seem to you to equal the delicacy of its flavor, which now appears to you flat and distasteful. Let us now go into the adjoining chamber, which is your apartment, and I will bring us coffee and pipes. The Bulls arose, and while he, who called himself Simbad, and who had occasionally named so, that he might, like his guest, have some title by which to distinguish him, give some orders to the servant, Franz entered still another apartment. It was simply yet richly furnished. It was round, and a large divan completely encircled it. Divan, walls, ceiling, floor, were all covered with magnificent skins, a soft, and down near the richest carpets. There were heavy maned lion skins from Atlas, stripped tiger skins from Bengal, panther skins from the Cape, sported beautifully, like those that appeared to Dante, bear skins from Siberia, fox skins from Norway, and so on. And all these skins were strewn in profusion one on the other, so that it seemed like walking over the most mossy turf are reclining on the most luxurious bed. Both lay themselves down on the divan. Cheap books with jasmine tubes and hambar mouthpieces were with, within reach, and all prepared so there was no need to smoke the same pipe twice. Each of them took one, which all lighted and then retired to prepare the coffee. There was a moment's silence, during which Simbad gave himself up to thoughts that seemed to occupy him incessantly, even in the midst of his conversation, and Franz abandoned himself to that mute reverie, into which he always sink when smoking excellent tobacco, which seems to remove with its fume all the troubles of the mind, and to give the smoker in exchange all the vision of the soul. Ali brought in the coffee. How do you take it? inquired the unknown, in the French or Turkish style, strong or weak, sugar or none, cool or boiling, as you please, it is ready in all ways. I will take it in the Turkish style, replied Franz. And you are right, said his host. It shows you have a tendency for an oriental life. Ah, those orientals, they are the only men who know how to live. As for me, he had it with one of those singular smiles which did not escape the young man. When I have completed my affairs in Paris, I shall go and die in the East. 
and should you wish to see me again, you must seek me at Cairo, Baghdad, or Isfahan. Ma foi, said Franz, it would be the easiest thing in the world, for I feel eagle's wings springing out of my shoulders, and with those wings I could make a tour of the world in four and twenty hours. Ah, yes, the Ashis is beginning its work. Well, unfurl your wings and fly into superhuman regions. Fear nothing, there is a watch over you. And if your wings, like those of Icarus, melt before the sun, we are here to ease your fall. He then sent something in Arabic to Ali, who made a sign of obedience and withdrawal, but not to any distance. As to friends, a strange transformation had taken place in him. All the bodily fatigue of the day, all the preoccupation of mind which the events of the evening had brought on, disappeared as they do with the first approach of sleep, when we are still sufficiently conscious to be aware of the coming of slumber. His body seemed to acquire an airy lightness, his perception brightened in a remarkable manner, his senses seemed to redouble their power, the horizon continued to expand. But it was not the gloomy horizon of vague dreams, of vague alarms, and which he had seen before he slept, but a blue, transparent, unbounded horizon, with all the blue of the ocean, all the spangles of the sun, all the perfumes of the summer breeze. Then, in the midst of the songs of his sailors, songs so clear and sonorous, that they would have made a divine harmony had their notes been taken down. He saw the island of Monte Cristo, no longer as a threatening rock in the midst of the waves, but as an oasis in the desert. Then, as his boat drew nearer, the songs became louder, for an enchanting and mysterious harmony rose to heaven, as if some Lorelei had attracted to attract a soul theater, or Amphion, the enchanter, intended there to build a city. At length the boat touched the shore, but without effort, without shock, as lips touched lips, and he entered the grotto amidst continued strains of most delicious melody. He descended, or rather seemed to descend, several steps, inhaling the fresh and balmy air, like that which may be supposed to reign around the grotto of Circe, formed from such perfumes as set the mind a dreaming, and such fires as burn the very senses. And he saw again all he had seen before his sleep, from Sinbad, his singular host, to Ali, the mute attendant. Then all seemed to fade away and become confused before his eyes, like the last shadows of the magic lantern before it is extinguished, and he was again in the chamber of statues, lighted only by one of those pale and antique lamps which watch in the dead of the night over the sleep of pleasure. They were the same statues, rich in form, in attraction and poesy, with eyes of fascination, smiles of love, and bright and flowing hair. They were Phryne, Cleopatra, Messalina, those three celebrated courtesans. Then among them glided like a pure ray, like a Christian angel in the midst of Olympus, one of those chest figures, those calm shadows, those soft visions, which seemed to veil its virgin brow before these marble wantons. Then the three statues advanced towards him with looks of love, and approached the couch on which he was reposing, their feet hidden in their long white tunics, their throats bare, hair flowing like waves, and assuming attitudes which the gods could not resist, but which stains with truth, and looks inflexible and ardent like those with which the serpent charms the bird. And then he gave way before looks that held him in a torturous grasp and lighted his senses as with a voluptuous kiss. It seemed to France that he closed his eyes, and in a last look about him saw that the vision of modesty completely veiled, and then followed the dream of passion like that promised by the prophet to the elect. Lips of stone turned to flame, breasts of ice became like heated lava, so that to France Yielding for the first time to the sway of the drug, love was a sorrow and voluptuous torture. As a burning mouth were pressed to his thirsty lips, and he was held in cool serpent-like embraces. The more he strove against this unallowed passion, the more his senses yielded to his thrall, and at length, 
weary of a struggle that takes his very soul. He gave way and sank back restless and exhausted beneath the kisses of this marvel goddesses and the enchantment of his marvelous dream. End of chapter 31《Chapter Thirty One of the Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Anka in Mannheim, Germany, August 2010.《The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter Thirty One. Italy. Sinbad the Sailor. Towards the beginning of the year 1838. Two young men belonging to the first society of Paris, the Vicomte Albert de Montcerf and the Baron Franz d'Epinay, were at Florence. They had agreed to see the carnival at Rome that year, and that Franz, who for the last three or four years had inhabited Italy, should act as Cicerone to Albert. As it is no inconsiderable affair to spend the carnival at Rome, especially when you have no great desire to sleep on the Piazza del Popolo or the Campo Vaccino, they wrote to Signor Pastrini, the proprietor of the Hotel de Londres, Piazza di Spagna, to reserve comfortable apartments for them. Signor Pastrini replied that he had only two rooms and a parlour on the third floor, which he offered at the low charge of a louis per diem. They accepted this offer, but wishing to make the best use of the time that was left, Albert started for Naples. As for France, he remained at Florence, and after having passed a few days in exploring the paradise of the Cassine, and spending two or three days at the houses of the Florentine nobility, he took a fancy into his head, having already visited Corsica, the cradle of Bonaparte, to visit Elba, the waiting-place of Napoleon. One evening he cast off the painter of a sailboat from the iron ring that secured it to the dock at Leghorn, wrapped himself in his coat and lay down, and said to the crew, To the island of Elba. The boat shot out of the harbour like a bird, and the next morning Franz disembarked at Porto Ferraggio. He traversed the island, after having followed the traces which the footsteps of the giant have left, and re-embarked for Marciana. Two hours after, he again landed at Pianosa, where he was assured that red partridges abounded. The sport was bad, Franz only succeeding in killing a few partridges, and, like every unsuccessful sportsman, he returned to the boat very much out of temper. "'Ah, if your excellency chose,' said the captain, "'you might have capital sport.' "'Where? Do you see that island?' continued the captain, pointing to a conical pile rising from the Indigo Sea. "'Well, what is this island?' the island of Monte Cristo, But I have no permission to shoot over this island. Your Excellency does not require a permit, for the island is uninhabited. Ah, indeed, said the young man, a desert island in the midst of the Mediterranean must be a curiosity. It is very natural. This island is a mass of rocks, and does not contain an acre of land capable of cultivation. To whom does this island belong? To Tuscany. What game shall I find there? thousands of wild goats who live upon the stones i suppose said franz with an incredulous smile no but by browsing the shrubs and trees that grow out of the crevices of the rocks where can i sleep on shore in the grottoes or on board in your cloak besides if your excellency pleases we can leave as soon as you like we can sail as well by night as by day and if the wind drops we can use our oars as Franz had sufficient time, and his apartments at Rome were not yet available, he accepted the proposition. Upon his answer in the affirmative, the sailors exchanged a few words together in a low tone. "'Well,' asked he, "'what now? Is there any difficulty in the way?' "'No,' replied the captain, "'but we must warn your excellency that the island is an infected port.' "'What do you mean?' Monte Cristo, although uninhabited, yet serves occasionally as a refuge for the smugglers and pirates who come from Corsica, Sardinia, and Africa, and if it becomes known that we have been there, we shall have to perform quarantine for six days on our return to Leghorn. That use! That puts a different face on the matter. Six days! Why, that's as long as the Almighty took to make the world. Too long away, too long. But who will say Your Excellency has been to Monte Cristo? "'Oh, I shall not!' cried Franz. "'Nor I, nor I!' chorused the sailors. "'Then steer for Monte Cristo.' 
the captain gave his orders, the helm was put up, and the boat was soon sailing in the direction of the island. Franz waited until all was in order, and when the sail was filled and the four sailors had taken their places, three forward and one at the helm, he resumed the conversation. Gaetano, he said to the captain, you tell me Monte Cristo serves as a refuge for pirates, who are, it seems to me, a very different kind of game from the goats. Yes, Your Excellency, and it is true. I knew there were smugglers, but I thought that since the capture of Algier and the destruction of the Regency, pirates existed only in the romances of Cooper and Captain Marriott. Your Excellency is mistaken. There are pirates, like the bandits who were believed to have been exterminated by Pope Leo the Twelfth, and who yet every day rob travellers at the gates of Rome. Has not your Excellency heard that the French charge d'affaires was robbed six months ago within five hundred paces of Vietri? Oh, yes, I heard that. Well, then, if, like us, your Excellency lived at Leghorn, you would hear from time to time that a little merchant vessel or an English yacht that was suspected at Bastia, at Porto Ferraggio, or at Civita Vecchia has not arrived. No one knows what has become of it, but doubtless it has struck on a rock and foundered. Now this rock it has met has been a long and narrow boat, manned by six or eight men, who have surprised and plundered it, some dark and stormy night near some desert and gloomy island, as bandits plunder a carriage in the recesses of a forest. But, asked Franz, who lay wrapped in his cloak at the bottom of the boat, why do not those who have been plundered complain to the French, Sardinian or Tuscan governments? Why? said Gaetano with a smile. Yes, why? Because, in the first place, they transfer from the vessel to their own boat whatever they think worth taking. Then they bind the crew hand and foot. They attach to every one's neck a four-and-twenty pound ball. A large hole is chopped in the vessel's bottom, and then they leave her. At the end of ten minutes the vessel begins to roll heavily and settle down. First one gunnel goes under, then the other. Then they lift and sink again, and both go under at once. All at once there's a noise like a cannon. That's the air blowing up the deck. Soon the water rushes out of the scupper holes like a whale spouting. The vessel gives a last groan, spins round and round and disappears, forming a vast whirlpool in the ocean. And then all is over, so that in five minutes nothing but the eye of God can see the vessel where she lies at the bottom of the sea. Do you understand now, said the captain, why no complaints are made to the government, and why the vessel never reaches port? It is probable that if Gaetano had related this previous to proposing the expedition, Franz would have hesitated. But now that they had started, he thought it would be cowardly to draw back. He was one of those men who do not rashly court danger, but if danger presents itself, combat it with the most unalterable coolness. Calm and resolute, he treated any peril as he would an adversary in a duel, calculated its probable method of approach, retreated, if at all, as a point of strategy and not from cowardice, was quick to see an opening for attack, and won victory at a single thrust. Bah, said he, I have travelled through Sicily and Calabria, I have sailed two months in the archipelago, and yet I never saw even the shadow of a bandit or a pirate. I did not tell your excellency this to deter you from your project, replied Gaetano, but you questioned me, and I have answered, that's all. Yes, and your conversation is most interesting, and as I wish to enjoy it as long as possible, steer for Monte Cristo. The wind blew strongly, the boat makes six or seven knots an hour, and they were rapidly reaching the end of their voyage. As they drew near, the island seemed to lift from the sea, and the air was so clear that they could already distinguish the rocks heaped on one another, like cannon-balls in an arsenal, with green bushes and trees growing in the crevices. As for the sailors, although they appeared perfectly tranquil, yet it was evident that they were on the alert, and that they carefully watched the glassy surface over which they were sailing, and on which a few fishing-boats, with their white sails, were alone visible. They were within fifteen miles of Monte Cristo when the sun began to set behind Corsica, whose mountains appeared against the sky, showing their rugged peaks in bold relief. This mass of rock, like the giant Adamasto, rose dead ahead, a formidable barrier, and intercepting the light that gilded its massive peaks, so that the voyagers were in shadow. 
Little by little the shadow rose higher, and seemed to drive before it the last rays of the expiring day. At last the reflection rested on the summit of the mountain, where it paused an instant like the fiery crest of a volcano. Then gloom gradually covered the summit, as it had covered the base, and the island now only appeared to be a grey mountain that grew continually darker. Half an hour after, the night was quite dark. Fortunately, the mariners were used to these latitudes, and knew every rock in the Tuscan archipelago, for in the midst of this obscurity France was not without uneasiness. Corsica had long since disappeared, and Monte Cristo itself was invisible, but the sailors seemed like the lynx to see in the dark, and the pilot who steered did not evince the slightest hesitation. An hour had passed since the sun had set, when Franz fancied he saw, at a quarter of a mile to the left, a dark mass, but he could not precisely make out what it was, and fearing to excite the mirth of the sailors by mistaking a floating cloud for land, he remained silent. Suddenly a great light appeared on the strand. Land might resemble a cloud, but the fire was not a meteor. "'What is this light?' asked he. "'Hush,' said the captain. "'It is a fire.' but you told me the island was uninhabited. I said there were no fixed habitations on it, but I said also that it served sometimes as a harbour for smugglers. And for pirates? And for pirates, returned Gaetano, repeating Francis' words. It is for that reason I have given orders to pass the island, for, as you see, the fire is behind us. But this fire, continued Franz, it seems to me rather reassuring than otherwise. Men who did not wish to be seen would not light a fire. Oh, that goes for nothing, said Gaetano. If you can guess the position of the island in the darkness, you will see that the fire cannot be seen from the side or from Pianosa, but only from the sea. You think, then, this fire indicates the presence of unpleasant neighbours? That is what we must find out, returned Gaetano, fixing his eyes on this terrestrial star. How can you find out? You shall see. Gaetano consulted with his companions, and after five minutes' discussion a manoeuvre was executed, which caused the vessel to tack about. They returned the way they had come, and in a few minutes the fire disappeared, hidden by an elevation of the land. The pilot again changed the course of the boat, which rapidly approached the island, and was soon within fifty paces of it. Gaetano lowered the sail, and the boat came to rest. All this was done in silence, and from the moment that their course was changed, not a word was spoken. Gaetano, who had proposed the expedition, had taken all the responsibility on himself. The four sailors fixed their eyes on him, while they got out their oars and held themselves in readiness to row away, which, thanks to the darkness, would not be difficult. As for Franz, he examined his arms with the utmost coolness. He had two double-barrelled guns and a rifle. He loaded them, looked at the priming, and waited quietly. During this time the captain had thrown off his vest and shirt, and secured his trousers round his waist. His feet were naked, so he had no shoes and stockings to take off. After these preparations he placed his finger on his lips, and lowering himself noiselessly into the sea, swam towards the shore with such precaution that it was impossible to hear the slightest sound. He could only be traced by the phosphorescent line in his wake. This track soon disappeared. It was evident that he had touched the shore. Every one on board remained motionless for half an hour, when the same luminous track was again observed, and the swimmer was soon on board. Well, exclaimed Franz and the sailors in unison. They are Spanish smugglers, said he. They have with them two Corsican bandits. And what are these Corsican bandits doing here with Spanish smugglers? Alas, returned the captain, with an accent of the most profound pity. We ought always to help one another. Very often the bandits are hard-pressed by gendarmes or carbineers. Well, they see a vessel, and good fellows like us on board, they come and demand hospitality of us. You can't refuse help to a poor hunted devil. We receive them, and for great security we stand out to sea. This costs us nothing, and saves the life, or at least the liberty, of a fellow creature, who on the first occasion returns the service by pointing out some safe spot where we can land our goods without interruption. Ah, said Franz, then you are a smuggler occasionally, Gaetano. Your Excellency, we must live somehow, returned the other, smiling impenetrably. "'Then you know the men who are now on Monte Cristo?' 
Oh, yes, we sailors are like Freemasons, and recognize each other by signs. And do you think we have nothing to fear if we land? Nothing at all. Smugglers are not thieves. But these two Corsican bandits, said Franz, calculating the chances of peril. It is not their fault that they are bandits, but that of the authorities. How so? Because they are pursued for having made a stiff, as if it was not in a Corsican's nature to revenge himself. What do you mean by having made a stiff? Having assassinated a man, said Franz, continuing his investigation. I mean that they have killed an enemy, which is a very different thing, returned the captain. Well, said the young man, let us demand hospitality of these smugglers and bandits. Do you think they will grant it? Without doubt. How many are they? Four, and the two bandits make six. Just our number, so if they prove troublesome, we shall be able to hold them in check. So, for the last time, steer to Monte Cristo. Yes, but your excellency will permit us to take all due precautions? By all means, be as wise as Nestor and as prudent as Ulysses. I do more than permit, I exhort you. Silence, then, said Gaetano. Everyone obeyed. For a man who, like Franz, viewed his position in its true light, it was a grave one. He was alone in the darkness with sailors whom he did not know, and who had no reason to be devoted to him, who knew that he had several thousand francs in his belt, and who had often examined his weapons, which were very beautiful, if not with envy, at least with curiosity. On the other hand, he was about to land, without any other escort than these men, on an island which